everyone, and welcome to a brand new spoiler review here from the Geek <laughs> oh, Buddies! <laughs> hey! And you all should enjoy that moment. That might be the last time we're in unison tonight as we talk about Eternals and do a spoiler review of this brand new MCU film that is out now from Chloe Zhao. It has divided the fandom for weeks. There's been so much drama with critics, with people revealing spoilers, with the fans online. So many people arguing about this movie, debating about this movie. We did do a non-spoiler review of the film, which you know a lot of you have watched, and thank you so much for those comments. But a lot of you wanted us to dive deeper into this film and do a spoiler review. So I thought, well, let's do it live. And thankfully, Michael and Shannon agreed to do it. And speaking of Michael and Shannon, we should introduce ourselves Hi, I'm the outlaw John Roker, writer, producer, and host here on the Outlaw Nation and specifically on the Geek Buddies. Michael. I am Michael Vogel, writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies, co-host on the Geek Buddies and absolute hater of Daylight Saving Time. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think we're all in, maybe one more time, we're all in agreement on that one. It currently, feels like, it currently feels like we are live at 1 a.m. It yes. is 6 o'clock. <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> Shannon. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you may have seen me on Silicon Valley, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and the Goldbergs. And maybe for this thing that I'm going to self-tape tonight in a few months. That's why I'm dressed like this, because I have a recorded audition. Mr. Mike Kalinowski is coming over and helping me in a couple hours. Oh, this boy. is a good decision. Having a drink beforehand, ah, maybe not the best decision. We'll see what happens. Hey, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with loosen, loosening some things up here inside you so you can deliver a great review and a great audition. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And thanks to all of you who are joining us already. Over 111 people joining us live already. I'm sure that number is going to go up as we go along. Please remember to hit a like on this video as you're watching it. Later on, if you watch it, leave a comment as you go through. Uh, I suppose some of you like to leave a comment after every point. Feel free to do that. But, you know, leave comments and let us know what you thought about everything. We'd love to hear about it. And we're going to give you, we're going to spoil everything. One more time, we're going to talk about overall our feelings on the film first. But then we're going to dive deep into all the stuff that gets revealed, including the post credit scene. So if you have not seen the movie, this is probably your last warning that this is a spoiler review. And we've been looking forward to talking about this one. Uh, I took Michael to see it at the premiere. The next night I took Shannon to see it. Uh, and all of us, I think, have seen it more than once already. So we, we're, we're ready to dive into this thing and break it down and analyze it. And remember the Streamlabs and Super Chats. Those are available. Those are open. I've pinned the Streamlabs address in the chat. It's in the description of this video. So send along your thoughts. We will read them. And maybe if there's time at the end, we might bring some of you in live to have conversations with us. We shall let's see, it. depending on let's how the review it. goes. Yeah, there we go. Everybody's drinking, so let's get it on. Um, <laughs> and a shout out to our producer, Sean Barrett, who is in the background, making sure there's no assholes in the comments. So, all right, let's uh, let, let's just drop this real quick. The this only is... assholes in this chat are on screen right now. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's absolutely <laughs> fair. This one is directed by Chloe Zhao. Chloe Zhao, also written by Chloe Zhao, Patrick Burley, and Ryan Firpo. Uh, the cinematographer here is Ben Davis. And I mentioned all those people I have a feeling we're going to talk about all of that as we go along. Here's the basic premise. The sag of the Eternals, a race of immortal beings with superhuman powers who have secretly lived on Earth for thousands of years, reunite to battle the evil deviants and unleash a new celestial, possibly, into the universe. All right, Michael Vogel, we start with you as we always do. What now, after having seen it and had it again, had a few more days, what is your overall feeling and thoughts about this movie, Eternals? Well, it was funny. When we went to the premiere, mm -hmm. I very much liked the movie, as we said in the non-spoiler review. But sometimes going to a premiere, it's a big event. Yep. You're on the carpet. You go to the bathroom and Taika Waititi walks past you. Like, you get, <laughs> it's a, you get in the mood. So sometimes uh, you, you might enjoy a movie more than you would in normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, so going in to see it this weekend, I was like, all right. The very split. I know that all the three of us didn't necessarily agree. Maybe I'm going to have a different reaction when I see it. Yeah. That did not happen. I love this movie. I love wow. it. I love this movie. Okay. I think I might I might have even liked it more the second time. Yeah. I was completely swept up in it. Mm -hmm. I uh this movie is super super divisive 
And I fall very firmly on the, I really love the, I love Eternals. I love all the characters. I'm super invested in it. I don't think the movie's perfect. And I do mm. have some problems with the story. And there's a couple things that I do have issues with. Yeah. Uh, you know, like most movies, it has its flaws. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I am definitely on Team Eternals. Yeah, it's a monumental task that Chloe Zhao was handled here, handed here. 11 new characters in one movie going way out into space, going centuries deep into our existence, dealing with uh, celestials, dealing with deviants, bringing in the Black Knight, bringing in the sword, bringing in uh, uh, Fire uh, Star Fox, bringing in all this stuff here that really expands the universe in one two-hour and 38-minute movie. Shannon McClung, you've seen this now more than once. What's your overall feeling now as you sit down to start this spoiler review with us on the Geek Buddies? So when your buddies go see the premiere the night before... Oh, and you get to go, go to the screening <laughs> um, ahead of most people, by the way. But yeah, it's, right. I didn't necessarily run into Taika, Taika Waititi in the bathroom. Christian Harloff was sitting in front of me, though, and we had a delightful <laughs> conversation. I mean, you um, know what? You know what? Just as good. Just as good. It can be. <laughs> All right, all right, Taika. <laughs> um, but, um, coming out of the movie, the big thing that that stuck out for me was I like a lot of this, but there's a lot that I didn't feel didn't feel that they stuck the landing. Mm. And coming um, coming into the uh, when we saw it the night before uh, yeah. last week, um, I was I was curious because a lot of the reviews were pretty middling, pretty lukewarm. Mm-hmm. Um, going in. There's so much stuff I really do like about it. I think a lot of the performances are really good. Um, some of the effects are, are amazing. The production design is fantastic. It, it was a monumental effort. I mean, this was a very, very big, this is a very, very big movie, not just with the amount of characters, but just the amount of story. I mean, there's just so much that they're that they're unfolding here. Yeah. Um, as I walked out, I mean, again, the parts that worked for me worked even better. The things mm-hmm. that didn't stuck out even more. And yeah. I think my big note would be, no, no, my big critique would be, it's just a lack of pacing. Mm. Um, I think this is a two hour and 38 minute movie that probably could have been, you could have cut out about 20 minutes of it, 25 yeah. minutes of it even. Um, that being said, I, the characters that I resonated with, I really hope we get to see them again. Mm -hmm. And the post-credit sequences I thought were very exciting. I mean, but I do think there is the possibility that, uh, the Marvel cinematic universe might start to buckle under its own weight. I hope that's not the case because Mm -hmm. I, even the ones that I don't love, I will still go back and watch. Like I don't love Iron Man three, but occasionally I'll be like, you know what? I want to throw on Iron Man three. I don't love Uh, The first Thor, occasionally I'll throw that on. I have no doubt when Eternals is on Disney Plus, I'll toss it on too. I mean, it's just Mm. being in love with this universe the way that I am, I'll I'll revisit every single movie. And Eternals will will certainly be a part of that. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, If I could throw my two cents in here, having seen it now three times, um, I went earlier today and I was like, I just went by myself. Uh, Because the Lady Outlaw is not ready to watch it yet. She's got to (laughs) work up to it. Uh, But I went by myself. And I have to say, the way I felt the second time about the movie seems to be very solidifying. seems to be solidifying itself inside me. In that, I enjoy the first hour of the movie. I enjoy getting to meet everybody, getting to see everybody, getting to see all these characters come together. These actors come together. Michael had a fantastic tweet talking about the diversity here. It was so seamless and so not a big deal. It just seemed matter of fact. We've been waiting for something like that for quite some time. People of color have been clamoring for that for some for quite some time in the Marvel Universe. And to see it happen here was great. I think there is about an hour in, there's that exposition dump. And to me, it takes a steady decline up until the end of the movie. And I'm like, by the end, I'm like, oh, God, let's just, this takes forever for Cersei to finally turn around and make a decision here. And I get a little frustrated watching the movie, how things all come together, because all of a sudden he realizes he's in love with her. It just, to me, it starts to become convenient rather than earned and organic. And that took away the overall vibe of the movie for me. Plus the fact that some of these characters, after I've fallen in love with them, they disappear for 30, 40 minutes of the movie and then come back, only have a little bit, and then boom, they're done. And to me, that's 
where I think the, the movie fails for me. You talk about pacing, Shannon, Michael, you said you had some issues. For me, it's about the character development that I think kind of falls apart with a majority of the, of the, uh, of the Eternals here, not the main ones that they focus on. That's where I get, get, get have issues with it. And we'll get to uh, some of the relationships and how they're portrayed in the, in the film as we go along here. But in the end, I still feel the same way I feel about it. I think it's a three and a half. Uh, I, it's not, it's not a great big thing. Uh, and, and out, out of 10, no, no, out of five. I usually do five. Oh, I usually okay. do five. No, not out of 10. No, 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 no. There's the, the cinematography here is gorgeous. Chloe Zhao does a fantastic job directing the movie overall. Her style is all over this movie. So you can't deny that the acting is stellar from everybody involved, including really Angelina Jolie to me is the mad standout of everybody because they give her so much to go through and she conveys it all. And the twists and turns at times work and other times don't, but we'll get into all of that as we go along here. So that's my overall three and a half out of five. I still feel very solid about that. Uh, someone who come, D train comes in here and says something. We should address it real quick. I understood the problems that some critics had with the movie, but a 48% on Rotten Tomatoes is ridiculous. A 65% would have been more plausible. I love this movie. So yeah, we will address that as we go along, but 48% right now initially in Rotten Tomatoes, it is kind of surprising. There have been you know, accusations from IMDb that people were, well, not accusations, but evidence that people were um, uh, dive bombing or review bombing this movie because of the gay storyline, because of the gay relationship with Fastos and Ben. But um, overall, though, there, uh, there have been some legitimate complaints about the movie, and we see this divisiveness happening all over the place on social media, even some critics going after other critics. And I'm, I'm just like, I'm confused by this overall because it's a movie. Everybody get back to their neutral corners and calm down. It's just a movie. I don't understand why it's eliciting such passionate anger and passionate defense of it. What, is, what do you guys think um, why it's at 48% and why it's eliciting such passionate uh, uh, emotions in, in critics? I actually, th I actually think what D Train says is great, and I think that this is the way to look at it because mm -hmm. I think what's happening right now is, if you didn't like Eternals, you didn't like Eternals. Yeah. And if you loved Eternals, you really love Eternals. The forty-eight percent is a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, but I think saying sixty-five percent would have been more plausible makes sense because I don't think that every person who hated Eternals is a misogynist, racist, horrible person who do, who only doesn't like it because of all of the social issues in the movie. Like, I, I we have a lot of friends who were with us when we went to go see the movie this week who I respect their opinions a lot, and they mm -hmm. just didn't connect with it. And mm -hmm. so I think that there are people who just legitimately don't connect with this movie. But the reason that we're all the way down at 48%, I think... Mm. is at least in part due to other things. I mean, we've just, we've seen it with Last Jedi. We've seen it like yes. literally every geek movie that comes out where there mm. is a female or a person of color or a gay person. Like we've seen it enough that you can't deny that when you are tabulating all of the reviews out there, that is an element in it. And to say yeah. that that's not an element is kind of ridiculous in this day and age with what we deal with on social media. But yeah. the other side of that is if you really, really loved Eternals, you can't say that everybody who gave it a bad review did it for insincere reasons. Some people just didn't like the movie, and that yeah. is okay. Yeah. I don't think that John is a misogynist. I think he's wrong about his opinion, but that's what you're here to discuss. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I'm not a misogynist. And I'll give you Krista Lemire, who hated the film, who is a female critic, who I respect very much, on RogerEbert.com and called it dull. So clearly, both men and women and people of color are not liking this movie too. Let's make that some of the critics that of color, some other critics of color have come after them for not liking the movie. And I think that's inappropriate. And you should be allowed to have your opinion about a film one way or another. You shouldn't be swayed to go along with the social justice point of view simply because it's there in the movie. It has to work. And I think that's our job as critics is to look at it, analyze it, and have our feelings about it, regardless of all that other stuff. Um, real quick, we've got some stream labs that came through. G Smith doing it. He said, Eternals has an 86% fan rating. This seems to be dividing critics, not fans. Fair, but somebody is is review bombing these movies. So that's it's the fans, not critics that are like the legitimate critics that are review bombing the movie in terms of because of the homosexuality or the homosexual couple or because of women being a part of this or the diversity of it. So but you might be right. And this could lead to 
Although the box office is okay. It's good. It's not great right now, but it could lead to it being a film that makes a lot of money. Don't forget Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars. Mikey, you were going to say something? Or Shannon? Go ahead, Shannon. Well, I was just going to say there's there's an expectations versus reality yeah. uh, uh, point of view as well that you have to come in with with where we are and what we're doing. Now, you know, you look at the box office for Black Widow and you you factor the Disney Plus in with that. The box office for um, Shang-Chi, which, which did a little better, but that I think it's probably going to have longer legs. Mm. Um, I think, I mean, I haven't gone through and read every review that Rotten Tomatoes uses to, to, to you know, come up with their score. Um, oh. are, are critics review bombing this? I mean, because that's, because the critic score comes from verified critics. Am I, right. am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. From, from, from Rotten Tomato critics or Tomato Meter approved critics, which okay. I am one of them, though okay. that's an accumulation of those yeah. reviews. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, okay. Mikey? I mean, I, well, I was going to say, I think for the purposes of us actually breaking this movie down, yeah. we should admit that there are people out in this world who hate this movie for stupid reasons. Fair. Like there are people that whether it's because they don't like a female directing a superhero movie or they don't like the diversity or they sure. don't like gay people kissing, there are people that did not like this movie for those reasons. I don't think any of us have any time for those people. Fair. So put those people aside, there are still people that just straight up love comic book movies, love diversity, love female directors, did not like this movie. Yes. Yes. So I think like that's what we're gonna like talk about now. And mm -hmm. there are people like me who full on love this movie. Yeah. And I'm more curious, rather than being like one side is right or one side is wrong, I think divisive movies are really interesting. I love, as, as we've discussed in the past, I really love Last Jedi. I don't mm -hmm. love all of Last Jedi. And Rise of Skywalker makes me like Last Jedi less, but, I love Last Jedi definitely more than the two of you do, and Last Jedi is another one of those hugely divisive movies. Sure. I think what's interesting is trying to understand why a movie's divisive, like how an audience that kind of generally all loves the MCU yeah. landed so differently on this movie. Because like yeah. I do the same thing. I love Mike, Mike Kalinowski and I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I go through Twitter the day after I see a movie, and I loved Eternals, so I'm retweeting every single person that said they loved Eternals. And Kalinowski, who did not necessarily love Eternals, is mm -hmm. responding to everybody that says they didn't connect with it. And he's like, exactly. So in our own geek social bubbles, Kalinowski is like, yeah, people on Twitter didn't like Eternals. And I'm like, people on Twitter loved it. Yeah. Uh, so there's <laughs> enough room for both, and we're going to break down why we thought, thought yeah. the way we did. Exactly. That's also why I stay off Twitter about those reviews. Chelsea Ann says, can't watch live, but still wanted to support. Can't wait to watch later. And I'm sure it will be a great discussion as always. Love the movie, by the way. Fredtastic314 says, I love the movie. The scenery was outstanding. The story was serviceable and interesting. Didn't have a hard time keeping up. This wasn't a, quote, we need to defeat the bad guy movie. So it did have a different vibe. Uh, and th that's very true, Fred. And then Eric underscore Nunez says, I love the Geek Buddies. Thoughts like it. Athena, Cersei, love them. Icarus, Macarus, best action sequences. Icarus should have should have more than one expression. Whew, yikes. Not sure what Kingo, Fastos, and Sprite were doing in the movie. Needed more of Gilgamesh, Druig. We're going to get into that in just a second. This is a great, thank you, Eric underscore Nunes, for this, because that's a great segue into the first thing that I want to bring up when we break down this movie, and that is this cast. This cast is absolutely extraordinary. When you look at all the people involved in this thing, and here are the characters, Ajax, Cersei, Icarus, Kingo, Sprite, Fastos, Makari, Druid, Gilgamesh, and Thena. And you look at this cast, Angelina Jolie, Gemma Chan, Richard Madden. You, you've got Kit Harington in this. You've got Salma Hayek, uh, uh, Brian Tyler, uh, uh, Brian Tyler, uh, oh God, Brian Tyler Henry. Ty what am I, Ty sorry, Brian Tyree Henry. you got all these people involved in this movie. Uh, and Shannon, I'll go to you since I went to Mike on the overall thing. Shannon, what did you think of this cast here and seeing what they were able to do, Liam McHugh, uh, Barry Keegan, what they were able to do with these characters and bring them to life? So overall, I really enjoyed all of the performances. Mm -hmm. um, there, So I'm going to say something unpopular here. Um, for Kumail Nanjiani, he was hilarious. Yes. Um, I thought all of his comedic scenes were fantastic. But the challenge with a performer who is known for being more of a comic performer, um, it can make uh, landing those dramatic beats a little tougher. Um, and I think it's partly, again, the expectation of what we're going to get from him. But I also think it's I think it's uh, it's his talent. Yeah. I don't think he I don't you can put as many muscles on him as you want. Sometimes he can't he can't land those dramatic beats. And when he's involved in a sequence immediately for me, 
the stakes were taken out of it. Like that attack in the woods at Druig's camp, um, whenever he was involved, I'm like, it's fine. He's going to, it's fine. Like he's going to be okay. Um, that being said, I still thought he was, he was really funny. And he was also paired with uh, Hamish Patel, who was oh my gosh. amazing. Like that. Her- and that's, Harish that's Patel an was great. Yes. Yeah. And that's an example of a, of a, of a performer who is incredibly funny, but did land those dramatic beats. Mm-hmm. When you get to Gilgamesh's funeral and you see him, you know, saying the prayer, I mean, that was an amazing, just a heart wrenching moment. Um, another performer that I don't think quite stuck the landing was Leah McHugh. And mm-hmm. some of that had to, I think some of that had to do with the writing. I think the, I think the scene on uh, Kingo's jet um, was very disjointed. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, as, as much as I, I do enjoy Chloe Zhao's work, I don't necessarily think she's great at directing comedy. Because mm. like ling- lingering shots don't work for laughs all the time. So comedy has to be a little quicker. Mm. Um, and that's why that didn't work for me. I mean, the, the whole conceit of Kingo is making a documentary about the Eternals. It just that just didn't land. What made mm. it work was Hamish Patel. Okay. Um, I thought Richard Madden and Jimmy Chan are both were both great. They just didn't really fit together. Like you yeah. don't really by their relationship, or at least for me, it didn't. Um, love Brian Tyree Henry, love Don Lee. I was so sad. Don that, Lee, uh, yes. G- Gilgamesh uh, um, uh, re- retired early. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Angelina Jolie, I mean, that's one of those examples. Of, like, this is why this woman is a movie star. I mean, yeah. what she's able to do um, with so little screen time is really, really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, I also thought uh, uh, Lauren Ridloff as Makari. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. I mean, she was one of she was one of my most favorite parts of the film. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Michael, that's a, a he just named 12 care 12 characters that you're introducing into this movie. We haven't even gotten to Ben or or Crow or even their son Jack or, or Harry Styles which we're getting into just a little bit later but like but what did you think about First of all, I, I referenced your tweet you spoke about how the how um seamless the diversity was. But what did you think about the acting overall? What did you think about the character work being done here by everybody in this movie? Do you share Shannon's reservations on some of these actors and some of these characters or not? I, you know, Shannon had spoken, Shannon and I had spoken about uh, Kumal Nanjiani uh, Mm. after the first screening. So I kind of went into the second screening with that in mind. And I don't think Shannon's 100% wrong. It didn't bother me as much as it clearly bothers Shannon. But I think that he does have a little bit of a point that I think Kumal Nanjiani is one of the funniest parts of the movie. Yes. And I think his comic chops really deliver on this movie. And I think he's really, really funny. I think him and Harish Patel both... uh, are just, they bring they bring so much levity uh, in almost every scene that they're in. But I think that maybe his dramatic moments aren't as strong as his comedic moments. So I think I can agree with that. I also definitely agree that although I really enjoyed Liam McHugh as Sprite, I also think that Sprite was a lot of good ideas, but like the, the, the execution, yeah. I think the biggest issue with Sprite, and I don't know that this is Liam McHugh's fault really, I think Liam McHugh did a nice job, they have to basically tell us that she's in love with Icarus, but they're yes. not necessarily showing us. Like we get that information because Kumal, uh, because Kingo actually says to her, "You're in love with Icarus," and then you're like, "Oh, okay, cool." But like, I didn't really pick up on that, right. and I think that's probably one of the one of the flaws in the movie is that that should have for for Leah McHugh's for Leah McHugh as an actress. I feel like the script didn't allow her to play everything that was there to play because that we didn't really really see. But beyond that, um. I don't have a bad thing to say about like and though and those are by the way I thought both of they both Sprite and Kingo were good, mm-hmm. um, but beyond that I think everybody was a fucking rock star. Uh, Angelina Jolie just stole that movie with yep. every single mini moment. Li- like the 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 amount that she can do with mm-hmm. so little is amazing. Kit Harrington is in the movie for like three minutes. He's the most charming person I've ever seen in my life. He's more charming <laughs> in three minutes than he was in eighteen seasons of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Uh, Richard Madden is Icarus. I thought did a really, really nice job. Um, I really, I really enjoyed him. I thought, uh, he played somebody who was tortured between his duty and his, uh, emotions really, really well. Gemma Chan was delightful, more subtle than you would, I think a lot of people would want in their lead for a Marvel character. Um, I think Salma Hayek brought a really kind of great maternal leadership to her role. Don Lee was amazing. Barry Keegan was amazing. Uh, Lauren Ridloff also was one of my favorites. I am a Makari stan all day long. Brian Tyree Henry was adorable. 
Uh, and I, I don't know if it's offensive to call such a big, strong presence adorable, but he was fucking adorable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Harish Patel stole the movie. I thought, like, everybody from top to bottom did a really, really, really good job. And I think, you know, John, to your point, yeah. one, of your criti- one of your criticisms about not getting to know the characters enough, yeah. look, you can say putting 11 characters in a movie is a bad idea, and you could argue that that's a valid point. I think once you've made the decision to put 11 characters in a movie, Mm -hmm. I think the mixture of amazing performances and really, really smart writing for the most part, I think they did a really good job. I think for me, in the first 20 minutes of this movie, to be able to go, all right, this is who this person is, this is who this person is, this is what they think about this, this is what they think, like they did a really, really good job in a very Mm -hmm. small amount of time giving me enough to connect to all the characters. And I do think this is one of the big turning points of the movie. I Like in looking at Twitter- in You mean divisive comments, points of the movie, yeah, divisive points. Yeah, like yeah. I, think, I think that for whatever reason, some people go into this movie and they are getting enough in 20 minutes between the actors mm-hmm. and what they are given about the characters that they are in love. Mm-hmm. And some people are not connecting. Mm-hmm. And I think after those 20 minutes, if you have fallen in love, with these 10 Eternals, you're good for the rest of the movie. You are on board, you are emotional, you are swept into it. And if you didn't connect, you're screwed. Like you're gonna be like, this is fine. I get it, it's cool. And I think that's the real distinctive part. And I'm really curious as to why I Hmm. super connected and John, you were like, yeah, Yeah. I just am not into it. I'm not into it. Yeah, so yeah, I am on the other side of this. So let me get into my thoughts on this. I I think Richard Madden was good as Icarus. I actually liked it. Look, Richard Madden is gonna do what Richard Madden does. He's not going to give you big, explosive, emotional. I've seen him in multiple projects now. The body If you haven't seen Bodyguard, it's fantastic on Netflix. Go watch that. He does, This is what he does. His face is an, emotion of, is an ocean of emotions, but the ocean doesn't always get disturbed. So you've got to look for it in his eyes. He's, he's going to make you... Emotion. <laughs> Good song lyric. Yeah, it's, I think Rick Ocasek said it in the 80s. But you can see it in his eyes. Uh, that uh, that what you've got to look for it in his eyes, what he's doing. I thought Gemma Chan was presented really well initially, but then as the movie went along, I got to be honest with you, I felt like she wasn't leading this team. She wasn't necessarily a lead. And that really surprised me because I like Gemma Chan and this is the biggest project she's ever been a lead of. And I think at times she buckled under the weight of it with her performance. I didn't 100% uh, buy it. I already spoke of my love of Angelina Jolie. She is the one to watch in this entire movie. As you said, Michael, what she does with so little screen time because they give her so much to do with the emotional journey that Thena is on. She handles it like an Oscar winning champ, is, which is what she is. I think so. I thought Sam Hayek was great with the um, with the maternal approach. But that being said, give me more. Why do we get a Bollywood scene? But I don't get Sama connecting with a Latino, with Mexican, with 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 the Incas, with the Mayas. Like, why don't I have that? I want that. Give me that. Give me Ajax. Let me know Ajax. She's the leader of this fucking team. Give me more with Ajax. This is the problem for me. Too many characters. People compare to Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians, that's five characters. If they had started with five Eternals and gone from there, I think this film would have killed. It would have been incredible. But spreading it out like this and then having them disappear. Like Barry Keegan, he's a good actor. But there's not much here other than an emotional outburst. Then he's just an angry, angsty kid all the way through the rest of the movie whenever he shows up. But there's not much. Why? What is it? Just the, Just one genocide got to you? You had seen 40 million genocides before you got to that moment. What was it about this one? Like, this is where I thought, as Shannon said, some of the writing let these actors and these characters down. I agree with you, Mike. Kit Harrington, fantastic as Dane Whitman. So great to see the weight of Game of Thrones off of him, and he's so loose and relaxed. I like Kumail Nanjiani. I don't agree as harshly with Shannon. I think he did handle those dramatic things as well as he could. I don't expect much drama-wise from Kumail, but he has it inside of him, and I saw it on uh, Silicon Valley in certain moments when he's showcasing some of his dramatic moments. You're right, Michael. Brian Tyree Henry, <laughs> lovable as hell. Lovable as hell. Loved him as Fastos. We'll get to the gay relation. We'll get to the homosexual relationship in a little bit. My feelings about that. Leah McHugh agreed. The, the script does not do her justice. But Laura Ridloff, Lauren Ridloff really stands out as well. So great with the sign language. Obviously, she's a deaf actress, but you know everyone else knew the sign language as well. So they're all connecting with her. And the way they shot her beating up Icarus in that sequence at the near the end of the movie was fantastic. But her genuine empathy and vulnerability and care for everybody and the fact the connection that she has um, with Druig really brings an interesting element 
to Druig that isn't there from Barry Keegan's singular performance. It's there in the chemistry between them for sure. Don Lee, fantastic. Harris Patel obviously steals the movie. So that's what I'll say about everybody so far. But like, you know, too many people disappear for too long. There's not enough fleshing out. And I think what they cop out with Michael and Shannon is that they cast it so well that the audience is not connecting necessarily to Fastos. They're connecting to Brian Tyree Henry. They're connecting to Salma Hayek. They're connecting to Richard Madden or to Gemma Chan, not necessarily Cersei or Icarus. And I think that's smart sometimes, but that can also blow up in your face sometimes. And I think for some people it did. That's, that's, if, I, if you're asking me to explain, that's what I think happened here. So Mike. where I think I would mm -hmm. disagree, and this is similar to like our Falcon and Winter Soldier yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. discussion as well. Like, look, yes, it would be great to have every character have every nuance of everything. But as Shannon's already wanting to cut 25 minutes out of this movie. Right. And to add that level of detail to everyone's story. So what you do sort of have to do from a storytelling standpoint is you have to go, well, what's the most important thing? Now, look, Kumal's Bollywood thing is just Kumal Najiani is our comic relief. Him and 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 Karun are like the comic relief yeah. and that's what we're going to we're going to tell that story. But beyond that, with each of these characters, this whole movie is about how you feel about humanity. Like yeah. this is really like what it is. And so like what we need to know about Ajax is that she is the loyal leader of the Celestials, and then later in the movie we find out that she has changed her mind. That Why? humanity, she literally says it. Right, she says it. Right. Right, but she, she says- She experience like, it, we don't see her go through it. That's my point. But what, but what she says is that watching humanity yeah. get to the point where they saved half of the universe, Right. these people are worth saving. Like, that's a right. big statement. I mean, I it's agree. a powerful statement. And I think that, you know, uh, F Fastos, Brian Tyree, like, knowing that Fastos sort of, like, thought that he had helped uh, humanity become so destructive, but then he found love, that Druig was, like, was so upset, like, basically loves humanity more than anybody and doesn't want them to fight and, w and wants to, like, use his powers to do that and kind of create this whole cult. Like, when you really break it down, you can look at every one of these characters and say, this is how they feel about humanity or this is how they feel about their oh, eternal sure. family. And the fact that you can do that uh, with 10 characters is actually pretty impressive. Like, no, do you no want doubt. more? Obviously, like, we always would love to see more, but then it would be like a four-hour movie. No, no, I don't know. Do we need him shooting a documentary? Cut that entire sequence out of Shannon said, replace it with stuff where Ajax well, is going through something. Replace it with stuff where, hey, why don't you show me how Fastos and Ben met? Why don't you show me what Ben said that magically made him care about humanity? Show me the relationship. Don't just throw in a gay relationship to check the box. I need more. If you're going to make it a big deal, make it a big fucking deal. And I think too much of the movie defaults into... Uh, we're just we're just telling them what they need to know. And let's get to the next thing. When I I want to experience it, I want to go through these things with these people. I want to see humanity through their eyes, Michael. And uh, that's why I think it left me a little bit cold. I understood everybody's stuff. I just think on some level, on some of these characters, I didn't connect to them because I didn't see yeah. them going through the stuff. That's my concern, you know. And people have already mentioned this in the chat, but yeah. and this was something that. Um, I feel like we we talked about John at walking out of our screening was this would have been a great Disney Plus series where you can oh, devote, the, devote the time to each character. Yeah, Drew can, gets his own episode. Macari sure. gets her own episode. Yeah, that would make yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I think that probably would have been a really, yeah. I, I think that would have been a really interesting way to introduce these characters to the overall universe, especially if you want to use them more going down the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, and I think I, Mike. Oh, sorry, Mike. Go no, ahead. no, no. No, I was gonna say, like, look, there's definitely an argument to be made that in a ten episode premiere series on Disney Plus, and each Eternal gets their own hour, mm. then you get to see all the things that you wanted. Like, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, like, and that that's like I said. Like, I think that I think what we're saying, like, with that many characters in a movie. You're not going to get all the things that John wants in two yeah. and a half hours. Like there's just there's just not there's just not the time. So right. once you've made the decision to do the movie, the way that I look at it is, did they uh, did they give you everything you needed to know to connect and care to the characters? And for me, and for half of the audience, that's true. <laughs> and for the other half of the audience, that's clearly not true. It so that's true. true. Well, but like you said, divisive movies 
are good for are interesting for certain reasons. They get us to talk about this stuff and look at the stuff for sure. Uh, let's stop here real quick. Irving Transplant says, "Love you guys. Thank you, Irving. Very, very good. important. The most important <laughs> comment of the night. <laughs> That's for damn sure. And I think we've had some other streamlabs come through. And let me read them. Oh, it's actually some straight uh, super chat. Sorry, guys. We've been going so fast. Let me swing back to these and read them. Uh, uh, Zeno uh, Zeno Core O One says, "This movie is a Greek fable." If you like Greek myths, the movie probably works. I bet lots of folks haven't thought about the Olympians in a while. Those myths come off try at face value as well. Those come off trying at face value as well. Do you guys think there's a Greek myth aspect to this? Michael, you're I think you know I think there is a mythic level to this storytelling. Mm. I think that there's a look, this whole movie, as as somebody said earlier, or as you'd said in one of the reviews, like this is not here's the bad guy, let's all team up and fight him. Like, this yes, isn't the, here is the arguably two-dimensional, typical Marvel bad guy in an origin story that we need to defeat so that the hero can really embrace their origin and move on. Like, that's not what this movie is. The right. Deviants, if anything, are a distraction. And I have a couple issues with the Deviant part of the storyline, which we can get to in a bit. But yeah. this movie is basically a family drama. Mm -hmm. Here's a family, big secrets revealed, everybody's pissed off about it, Everyone has a different opinion on it. And ultimately, Icarus is the heavy in the end of the movie. Yeah. And even he is not the heavy that's going to be like, I'm going to kill everybody. He says he's going to do it and he plays it, but he even loves his family. So like yeah. the drama of what do we do? And actually, I think what's also cool about this movie is it presents and in the myth, in the bigger mythological sense is, mm -hmm. look, the Celestials have been creating billions of universes for billions of years. Yeah. This is how they do it. By not letting the Celestial be born, like Kingo says it, Icarus says it, it's like, you're saving humanity to prevent billions of more planets. Is that the right trade-off? Is it not? Like, to me, that is a compelling debate. Like, there are arguments to be made on both sides. And I was like, I mean, it's a Marvel movie. I'm pretty sure Earth isn't going down, but this is an interesting discussion. So yeah. I think if you're into those bigger mythical things, you, are, you eat this movie up. You are like, I am yeah. in this. And if you are like, the fuck is all this? Everyone's just talking about shit. I want to see them fight some bad guys. Then this is probably not your cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, is there a term for planetary planetary xenophobia? I want to know if there's a term for that. Where you go, Don't, you know, keep my planet, but you can fuck Neptune up all you want. Just like, <laughs> I want to know. I want to know. Uh, that, that was one of my one of my favorite parts earlier on in the movie is when Dane and uh, Cersei are having that conversation where he talks about uh, Icarus, the you know the boy who flew too close to the sun, right. and she and and uh, uh, Cersei says. Uh, oh yeah, that was something Sprite made up. And uh, like that, I'm like, that's so interesting. Like mm -hmm. I would love to, and again, the length, of the length of the movie is the length of the movie, but I'm like, I would have loved to have seen them individually at different points in history. Like yes. I think that would have been really, really cool. The end credits, I loved. Mm -hmm. I love seeing the different artifacts and how they related to each character. I was yeah. like, oh God, I wish yeah. we would have seen, wish we would have seen more of this. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? There may be more coming. I don't think no matter how the how it does in the box office that we're done in any way, shape, or form with an Eternals follow-up for sure. If we uh, got a Thor three after Dark World, we're gonna get more Eternals. Let's just be real, guys. Oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, oh yeah, you know, no it's offense, a good no move. Yeah, you know. <laughs> all right, Casey Briggs says the actors were all amazing in my opinion, but I do not think Richard Madden and Gemma Chan had chemistry. The other couples were more interesting. Um, Casey, let's put a pin on that because that's the next thing I want to talk about is the couples in this movie. So I will, we will come back to your comment and uh, highlight it. Joel Barari says, Rob Stark and Jon Snow, Cersei, I love you. Me? What? So that's what Joel said his reaction was. Um, Jay Meister 25 says, Drew cared about humanity the most and hated to see them fight. One of the best yeah. MCU characters because he's lo he's logically wrong but morally right. Yeah, but he also wanted to control them against their will to stop them from fighting, and which has shades of one division. So, yes, he cared about humanity, but he only cared about humanity if they stopped fighting with each other. That's not humanity. Well, so, no, I mean, literally, what you just said is what he says in the movie. He literally yeah. says, I've thought about taking control of all of them. Yeah. But if I did, they wouldn't be human is literally right. what he like. That's what he realizes. But then but he, he took is... control of a bunch of people and did it anyway. No, no, no. That was earlier. He says that modern day, like when they went right, oh, right, when, they're, uh, yeah, right, when, right. when they're, when they're, um, I think when they're uh, having the funeral for Gilgamesh, it's around then that he right. says it. Like, yeah, when he's 
earlier he does take control of those people and he like takes off and he's like fuck it and it is like he the whole movie is like look humanity's no, 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 flawed no, no, and mike i mean i mean when he has his his uh his uh colonel kurtz situation set up where he's in control of he's not in control of all of them the entire time though he, he controlled them at all the right. end no he didn't i mean you can see it in their eyes who, who do you think they're building all that stuff for themselves right and he pulled them out i'm sure if any of them try to leave he always goes uh, and, and controls them don't you think you think they're uh, all willingly well, there that i can't say but he does let them go at the end because they're in at, danger. eventually yeah look i'm I'm not saying that what he's doing in his little commune in the jungle is all hunky dory. That's not a person, man. Like, I don't, but but I think but I mean I think that again, what I find interesting is how when we do catch up with each of these people, seeing how they have interacted with humanity or haven't. Like the fact that he went off and had his little commune with his people that he controls as much as he controls, but he's just doing it to that group of people. He's basically a cult leader. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and whereas Sprite's whole issue is that she can never quite fit in because people realize she doesn't age. Gemma Chan, super comfortable with humanity. Icarus, super not and removed. Mm -hmm. Ajak is on a journey with humanity. Gilgamesh and Thena completely remove themselves because of Thena's mad weary. Uh, Makari, as much as I love her, kind of just goes and chills in the ship. Like, she's all about collecting artifacts. That's clearly part of her vibe. But, you know, and Fastos felt that humanity betrayed him or felt that he, you know, humanity, he had helped uh, contribute to humanity, the the worst parts of humanity and then found love. So, I mean, like each one of them in their way, everything about them is how close or far away they are from humanity. Mm -hmm. And then that really comes into play when the question is, should we let them all die? Yeah. You know, I have a question for you guys and I don't, I don't want to get off course here, but do you think that Chloe Zhao used Nagasaki and Hiroshima because she's Asian and Japan and the Japanese connect, not she's not Japanese, obviously, but the connection to the Asian cult and that being one of the most incredible crimes in the history of man, would another director have used the Holocaust him, you know, because they created the, the, you know, all the military weapons, the ovens to kill Jewish people. Like, would that have been the standard default thing? Did you like that they used Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Do you think that was the reason, though, because she's an Asian director? No. Okay. Because I think when you look at you, you look at what mankind has made technologically, it seems like the dropping of of the atom bomb. That is the yeah. that is, is the that the biggest. breaking point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah. I think fair. I think if, if Fastos fair. represents, adva- you know, we need to advance technology because that's what's great for evolution. I think dropping the atom bomb from a technological standpoint yeah. is the one of the single most tragic things uh problematic things that we've done so i think yeah. it, it tracks for that now maybe that had more resonance for her maybe she got there fa- you know like maybe maybe yeah. that decision came earlier in the process but uh but it seems like it's the right decision uh d- whether whether you have an asian director or not yeah fair enough fair enough and we're gonna get rdj in an oppenheimer film so you know it, it all kind of <laughs> exactly. wheels within wheels within wheels uh all right jesse banana says <laughs> I, lo- I loved everyone except cersei part of me understands why she played the character the way she did She's she's sort of the introverted character who underestimates herself, but it was hard to feel particularly motivated by her. Yeah, Jesse, if I could chime in first on this one, I 100% agree with you. As I've said already to Michael and Shannon multiple times, they're sick of me saying it. I got so frustrated because I was like, Cersei, for the love of God, fucking do something. And finally, two hours and 25 minutes into the movie, she does something. And it was just incredibly frustrating to be like, these are all the signs. You know, uh, she chose you to lead after she died. Like, it's all here. So I think the writing kind of undercut that for me. What did you guys think? Did you guys have any problems with Cersei's journey in the back half of the movie? Yes, but no. Okay, well, okay. I've, there's two things about Cersei that okay. I want to say. And okay. the first is I think that one of the problems the movie has is dealing with Cersei's uh, power power mm-hmm. power slash increasing of powers like they make such a specific point in the movie that she can't deal with organic material uh-huh. like even in uh the documentary that uh kingo is doing she's like i can turn a rock into this i can they make it very clear you know dane dane uh kit harrington is like turn me into a giraffe she's like i can't do organics mm-hmm. and then they have that scene in the jungle where she's attacked by the deviant and she sort of turns it into like yeah. mutant tree yeah. and then they're like oh i guess i do have this power and then when they tell fastos he's like well that's really important information and then she goes and does it to the celestial and I think that they were trying to, there's a, there was a 
idea that the emotional arc and the power arc needed to be like, Cersei underestimates herself. Cersei is more powerful than she thinks she is. And then when we get the Unimind, Cersei does amazing things. And I don't know that, like, the whole thing made a ton of sense, like, with the powers thing. And that kind of was one of the parts where I was like, I see what they're doing. I don't know that this works. And I think that goes along with what you're talking about Mm -hmm. with... And I think this comes from having, like, maybe a female director and being a more feminine sort of... Like, this movie is about love is the most powerful thing of all. Yes. Like the thing that the thing that wins at the end, it's great that Cersei gets the Unimind and can, like, put the Celestial to sleep. But yeah. really what happens at the end is, like, Icarus can't kill her because he loves her. And right. her love of humanity, like, like, it's love that really does this. And so having a character in the center of your movie that is unsure what they are supposed to do. Right. Can't decide, doesn't think they are powerful enough to do it, and then at the end steps up to the plate because they have to, that is a tall order. Like, we are very, very used to active, extroverted heroes who are going to go take names and kick ass. So the fact that this whole movie revolves around love is the most important thing and you protect the things that you love and I, Cersei, who am not sure what I'm supposed to do or why I was chosen because I'm not one of the uh, I'm I'm not one of the active members of the Eternals. Right, right. Um, I'm going to step up and do this really active thing because I love humanity more than anybody. Yeah. It's challenging. I bought it because, like I said, the ideas of this movie really, really, like, sparked my brain and I was really right. into it. But I can see how having a more introverted, non-active hero at the center of everything can be something we are not used to watching yeah it mm. can be a bit, it can be a bit challenging and certainly you make a great point there michael like as in terms of feminine point of view look i'm a straight cisgender male and i look at this and and, and i understood what everyone was like icarus lead us you know the almost most most of them in that moment think icarus including sprite should be leading the team but he defaults to her to kind of support her but this could also be a connective tissue and again i'm saying this as a, as a straight male um uh, is it that is it does Gemma just sorry, sorry, just Chloe Zhao, you know how sometimes directors have their leads essentially be mirror reflection of themselves. Is this a kind of a subtle, subtle um, lesson that she's or message that she's trying to put out about how women will doubt themselves when they come into these positions of power and it takes everybody supporting them to to get them to that next level that's what people need to be doing is supporting these people to help them ca- take on the big task and they will succeed what she may be kind of saying that as a subtle message underneath it all a social commentary because this this film certainly has it you know what what do, what do you think uh, Shannon and Mike I mean that's not that's not what I took from it mm-hmm. um I I took it okay. more as she was just sort of a inactive protagonist okay. um I I didn't get any personal personal connection with that but you you very well could be right um that was sort of like one of my issues with the first fantastic beast movie is is uh 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 eddie eddie's character his oh yeah name is, yes. uh, newt, he, newt scamander yeah yeah scamander right um i found him also to be a very uh inactive it's protagonist yeah. which was you know it was just it just leaves a lot to be desired in terms of eternals you have so many other characters to service that I think you could you can make that journey more interesting, hmm. but I don't think they had the story real estate, even though she was essentially the lead. Okay, Mikey, quick thoughts on that? Am I off base? I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're off base. I mean, I can't okay. really say what Chloe Zhao was bringing personally because hmm. I don't know Chloe Zhao, but I do think that for me, as the person who like, d- despite my kind of issues with the logic of like, I can. The, I, the organic to I can mm. do the deviant to I do the thing, which makes sense in tracks, but I think was a little bit clunky. Yeah. Um, as far as her own journey, like I found it compelling to have her right away when she finds out about the Celestial, when she yeah. finds out what the real deal is with the Celestial, when she talks to uh, Arashem and he's like, mm-hmm. hey, you gotta, you gotta let the Celestial be born and everybody's gonna die. She right <laughs> away is like, we can't let this happen. Right. And uh, and clearly there's, you know, division in the ranks and dissension in the ranks about that. And I think that it's, you know, nice to see her be so steadfast in her love of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's not the most active thing necessarily. That's not like the I'm the big badass hero who's going to go kick ass. But like, I think that the movie is kind of making a point by having the lead be someone who is the most empathetic 
mm-hmm. and the antagonist ultimately, which is Icarus, be the most powerful. Yeah. Like Icarus is the guy that should be the hero. He should be the leader of the Justice League. I mean, Kingo and every Kingo and Sprite are like, you're the boss. Like they call right. him boss. Like you are right. Like the movie where the movie is making a point is the alpha male of this team. The straight white male of this team. The straight white yeah. male of this team who is the alpha male of this team. Yeah. There is an assumption that he should be the next in line after Ajax. Right. And the fact right. that Ajax chooses Cersei uh, and that people don't necessarily agree with that decision or think that she should be in charge i think you are making a lot a, a pretty heavy statement about women in the workplace yeah. men in the workplace everything else and the fact that cersei ultimately is the one who steps up and is most powerful like i dug that story i don't know yeah. if it was done perfectly but like it definitely resonated enough for me that i was feeling it certainly women supporting women and women of color supporting women kind of operating on a lower level there uh, subtly throughout that situation for sure possibly that's uh, yeah um all right let's see uh, b- 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 let's see what else we've got bk finest says i went into this expecting it t- uh, to connect with the current mcu without just a few throwaway lines on second viewing i looked at it as a standalone and enjoyed it much more great performances story was a little dull and dialogue heavy but still very good yeah did it bother you guys that it didn't connect up with the rest of the MCU as overtly as something else? Or did you treat this as like an origin story, like Black Panther, which had only occasional reference to the overall MCU storylines? I mean, it didn't bother me. I mean, I think right, I think as an audience, uh, being with the MCU now for you know over 10 years, yeah. um, we're sort of conditioned mm-hmm. to be like, how is this going to affect everything else? How is this going to connect to everything else? And I think that's a challenge. I think Shang-Chi did it did it pretty well, yeah. Um, despite the fact, you know, the 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 Mandarin connection, um, but that was when mentions of the MCU were made. They did seem a little obligatory. They felt a little mm-hmm. shoehorned. I mean, and again, I'll because I'm picking on Kumail Nanjiani um, when he when he talked about how you know Th- you know Thor used to chase me around as a kid. Now he won't call me back. I was like, like yeah. Why did wow. you need that? I, that that whole dinner scene was a little weird. Every time, who's going to take over the Avengers? Like, I that just seems weird to me to have that conversation with the Turtles yeah. who've been around for centuries. It's such a small thing to worry about in the whole grand scheme of things. But did you did it work for you, Mike, or did you feel clunky about it as well? I felt I felt that maybe that dinner scene, a couple of those lines were maybe a little. I enjoyed them. I thought they were fine. I didn't think that I I wasn't like Shannon over here who was like, <laughs> like I was like it was fine. Like it was a perfectly fine. Like that. Yes, you live in the Marvel universe and there's superheroes, but I think that you're overlooking the big connection, which is this entire movie. Yeah, is based around the snap. Like this entire yes, movie, true. it's all happening because of the snap. You're right. Because of what happened in Infinity yeah. War and Endgame. If that hadn't happened, it wouldn't be time to give birth to baby Celestial. And <laughs> I think the fact again that Ajax so specifically says to Icarus that, like you know, throughout all of the time that they watched humanity grow, that they that that humanity has evolved to this place. That despite all of our and like really from a bigger sort of MCU standpoint, the Marvel Universe is all about a bunch of people that Mm -hmm. have flaws and are not perfect and still make it work. I mean, Tony Stark is the most flawed human being in the world who makes mistakes every fucking movie, but he's still the hero that saved the fucking half the universe when he snapped everybody back. And I think that for Ajax to sort of use the snap as, look, humanity is flawed. Humanity is not perfect. They're a mess. But these people, with one snap of their fingers, brought back half the universe. She's talking about Tony. I mean, like she's yeah. like really like, and and that and that Tony Stark, in all of his flaws and all of his issues and all of his imperfections, is still pretty fucking amazing to the point that Ajax, who has let millions of planets in her life just be destroyed, is like, yeah, I think this one's special. And so I think, does it have all of the connect? Like. That it feels super separate. This is a whole new part of the Marvel Universe. We are in a whole cosmic territory. This is Jack Kirby craziness. But I think that the movie is sort of anchored around this idea of what happened with the snap is kind of the biggest Marvel connection and and the one that's the least clunky. Yeah, fair. Fair point. Some would say Steve Rogers has been messing up stuff since the beginning, but you know, well, I digress. Uh, let's see. Let's let's go to the next thing. Uh, uh, Jesse Banana said, "I wouldn't know how to change the way she played it. None of her romantic interests were believable. I loved everyone else's friendship slash romantic interests except Gemma's with both men. Also, the ensemble helped cover up for her, in my opinion. I'll take Barry." 
That's what Jesse says. All right, so let's <laughs> let's we've got some more super chats and stream lives, but let's let's jump into that. What I mentioned earlier, since this is a good jumping off point, the relationships in this movie. Michael, swing back to you on this. We have Fastos and Ben. We have Cersei and Icarus. We have Cersei and Dane. We have um, uh, uh, Makari and uh, Drew and uh, Druig. Do, do what uh, and and Don and Gilgamesh and Thena. What 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 did you think about the relationships? Which one stood out for you, and which one did you not really one hundred percent invest in? I, I think if I was going to rate them, I think mm. that Gilgamesh and Fina hit me the hardest. Mm. Like the the bond between them was just so beautiful. I thought Druig and Makari were within like two scenes, just kind of lovely. Mm-hmm. I just loved I just loved the clear attraction that those two had for each other. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't disagree that I think that Gemma Chan and both Kit Harrington and Richard Madden, I it didn't throw me out of the movie. I accepted that they th- those were the romances that she had. But yes, I didn't. I wasn't like uh, their chemistry wasn't off the charts. Okay. But what about Fastos and Ben? Let's 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 settle on that one now. You you know, as we've said before, the resident homosexual and the geek buddies, talk to me about a what it was like. What it was like to see this um, relationship happen. The kiss, which elicited a, ma- we were at the uh, pre- uh, the uh, premiere, elicited a massive reaction from the audience. Did you think that they did this relationship justice uh, in the movie? Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, I think I think it's hard to explain to somebody who is not uh, LGBTQ okay. what it is like to see something that you didn't realize for so long you were missing seeing. Like there is, we have seen heroes kiss their girlfriends, wives, whoever, goodbye, uh, you know, the the big kiss at the end of the movie a thousand times. Mm. And whenever there's gay characters in, in the history of usually the way this plays, like they don't show, maybe you get a whole, you, they hold hands, they look at each other longingly. And I think that like, look, the fact again, that you set up Fastos to be this person who really turned his back on humanity. And then when you meet him, he's got this husband and this kid, and this is what's the most important thing in the world for him. And like, I think the reason that the kiss elicits the reaction that it does is because gay people have been trained to not expect it. Like, we thought we were gonna get, he kisses his son, Maybe he hugs, maybe he hugs Ben and goes away. So when you got that kiss that is just a little kiss, it's a goodbye kiss. It's not like the craziest, most earth shattering thing in the world. But the fact that we just get to see that in the movie, like I teared up, like it really, really, it hit me hard. And I didn't know that it was going to hit me as hard as it did because as little as it was, as much as it was just a little tiny moment in the bigger scale of this epic, huge movie, uh, it was a moment that we don't usually get to see. Okay. And we see it all the time with cisgender straight relationships. And yeah. to, to see it to see it this way was just like, y- yes, it, like, it took too long for us to get there. Could we have more? Should we have more? Sure. But the fact that we got it, like it really, really hit me. Yeah. Maybe I'm too much of an ally. In 2021, I'm like, this is the least you can do. Give me more. I wanted no, no, to no. know Ben. No, I no, wanted no. to get to know Ben. Yeah. The least you can do. Yeah is have a gay guy in a support group after the snap mentioned that he went on a date. That's the least you can yeah, do. But they're fair, fair. But this isn't that much of a leap. And that's what frustrated me. I wanted a whole relationship with them. I wanted to know Ben. I wanted to know how they met, what he said, how he, how his, um, how he wore down Fastos and changed his mind about humanity. I don't mean wore him down like browbeat him. I mean, just the relationship changed his mind about humanity. I would like to have seen a little more of that. But, you know, that's my gripe with it overall. But, I, but I, you know, I'm going to obviously defer to Michael on this. Uh, but Shannon, to your point, John, those, yeah, are yeah. All, that, those are great ideas. Like, that's so interesting. Yeah, like, I mean, where, where we leave him at the end of World War II to where we find him uh, modern day, like, you're right. Like, that would be, that's a compelling story. Like, what was this character's journey yeah. to get to this point? Because how old is that kid supposed to be? Nine, ten? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. How many years have they been together? What was the start of that relationship? What was what was the conversation that they had to come to like, we're gonna be parents? I mean, you are absolutely right that that is a great story. Yeah. And maybe in some capacity later, 
maybe we'll get to see it. And I, I and, and see. I, can I throw one more? Th- a couple things in there, Mike, before and, and please respond to this as well. Also, you're a black man in America. Show me that experience. You're a black gay man in America. Show me that experience. And I think Disney kind of copped out by throwing it in, but not fleshing that out and letting us explore it. Because Brian Tyree Henry is a magical actor that we could have connected to more. So, Again, sorry, Mike, look. Well, it's like, look, you can go through nearly any movie that exists. Like, yeah, you know what? I would love to know why Nakia and T'Challa broke up. I would like to know what their relationship was Fair. like when they fell in fell in love with each other. I would like to know when they broke up, were they in a fight, were they not? Like, how are they friends now? Like, with any, I would like to know how Okoye became a Dora Milaje. I would like to know what her training was like. Why is she the leader of the Dora Milaje? Like, with any character that exists in any movie, you can go, I want to know more. I want to know the backstory. I want to know the history. But to put on Fastos, I want to know what your experience as a black man in America is. I want to know your experience as a gay man in America is. I want to know how you met Ben. I want to know why you guys got together. I want to know how you did this. Like, is that all great? Yes. Like any one of those things is absolutely fertile story ground, Mm -hmm. but you got 11 characters. You got like, you just got like, there's a movie. You got, there's (laughs) stuff that has to happen. And already, Already, half the audience is like, this movie went on too long and it's super boring. And you're like, let's go in and do a biography on every celeb- on, on no, every Eternal. What, and I'm like, no, uh, sure, uh, I what, agree with you. <laughs> what I'm like is, cut six of these people and let's focus on these five and give them the fleshed out story. But I take your point. Absolutely, Mike. Shan, that's, uh, Shan finish the, fin- what are your thoughts about yes. all the relationships I pointed out here? Which one did you stood out for you? Which one did you not quite connect to? So the ones that I really liked, I love the Druig Makari relationship, even mm-hmm. though they're all thousands of years old because they are the younger uh, presenting characters. Um, I love the fact that they kept it a secret for thousands and thousands of years mm-hmm. that when Fastos and I think Sprite see them at the Domo and like, whoa, 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 what is this? What is this? Um, I love that. I mean, there's just, there's a uh, uh, mis- mischievous uh, bond there that the mm-hmm. two of them have. Yeah. Um, especially when Druig started rocking the biker jacket later in the movie. <laughs> um, I loved, loved Gilgamesh and, and Thena. Like when Don Lee, when he, when he died and I was, so, I was heartbroken. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though we didn't get a ton of it, like you, you see him taking her hand at one point, we're never explicitly told this is a romantic relationship. Is this a yeah. friendship? You just right. know that these two people have a bond and the sacrifice he makes, like, mm-hmm. I will go with her. Like, I don't, I don't want her to lose her memories. Right. Um, like, obviously, like everyone has said, the, the uh, Icarus Cersei relationship didn't really resonate and I'm starting to think like maybe was that by design because I do think Dane and Cersei for the limited amount of time they had yeah. together I do think there was chemistry I, I agree and I bought that I, I, I think they had more chemistry yes. for sure yeah but also I mean something that I thought was really I, I wish they had explored this a little bit more like one of the heartbreaking things for Icarus is not only that has he lost his love to to another guy she's essentially choosing humanity over him Mm-hmm. And I right. think that makes for an interesting an interesting dynamic later, especially as she's the one who discovers he is he is going against the plan. He's he's with he's with uh, Arishem. Right, right, and killed Ajax. Yeah, pretty massive thing for sure. Mike, uh, I, I think Shannon makes a point. I mean, I look, I it, it I'm I'm clearly biased in that I love the movie, but yeah. uh, but there is a point to be made that Icarus and Circe should be. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's a little bit of both. Like, I think if Cersei and Icarus had had stronger chemistry, it would have yep. made the ending feel even more tortured on Agreed. Icarus's part. Agreed. Um, so I think that it would have been helpful for them to have more more chemistry. But I think you could also argue that she clearly likes Dane more. I mean, Dane mm-hmm. is humanity, and she likes humanity more, and she's always going to choose humanity, and that was the problem with their relationship. So you could argue it that way, but I think it would have helped if you had really, like, especially in that moment when they were back uh, in the desert, basically, where they, the rock they had sex on, uh, and they kind of held hands and had that moment. Um, if you had maybe felt the chemistry <laughs> even stronger. Yeah. Yeah, I I didn't. I didn't. And, you know, from the beginning, though, they kind of tip their hand. She's looking out at Earth and it's beautiful. He's looking at her saying it's beautiful. And so that's the difference, right? So from the beginning, you know, but still, I agree with you, Michael. 
and Shannon, a better chemistry between those two would have made those final moments it, a little more powerful, especially his decision to fly into the sun. Yeah, I mean, look, it's great. Like, I like one of the things I really liked, I was talking to somebody after the movie, and mm. they had wished that Dane had been in it more than Kit Harrington had been anymore, because they were like, well, that's the, that's the love triangle of the movie. And I was like, well, no. I was like, the love yeah. triangle of this movie is... Icarus, Circe, and humanity. humanity that's right. that's the love triangle, and Dane kind of represents that. But you know, Circe is choosing between her 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 Eternals family and what their duty is, right. and her love of humanity. And Icarus is choosing between Circe and his duty, and he you know, and ultimately he can't square with that, which is why he flies into the sun. Yeah. All right. There we go. Uh, let's get into some more of these, and then we'll swing back to the concepts of the the Unimind. Uh, uh, of the Celestials, of Brainstorm. Max, Max, Brainstorm. Max, Cohen, Max Cohen, yes, it was the old classic Mesopotamian fuck rock. That is what that was. <laughs> That's exactly what that was. The old Mesopotamian fuck rock. It's the one Makari couldn't find. Where is that fuck rock? It's the one art <laughs> artifact that I cannot find. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure I get all these. Uh, okay. Uh, Vogel. Oh, yeah. The use of deviance was my biggest. Okay. So Max Cohen says, the use of deviance uh, was my biggest issue with the movie. I was hoping for more. I thought they'd have a bigger plan to deviantize the sleeping celestial and create Galactus for the MCU. So that's where we get a little bit Ooh. dangerous here, Max, because you're starting to like, well, the movie didn't do what I thought it was going to do. So that's where you kind of slide out of criticism a little bit. So, but we can address the idea of the, the deviants. We'll swing back on that, Max. So we'll put a pin on that. We'll swing back on that. We're talking about the overall concepts. And like we said, Casey Briggs, hope we answered your question about the relationships overall with that conversation we just had. RPK says, Vogel, time to give Zack Snyder his props. Chloe Zhao has spoken about how Man of Steel yes. was a big influence on Eternals. Don't worry, John. We'll start the campaign now. Hashtag release the Zhao cut. The Zhao cut. So there you go. Uh, yes. Michael, many people. Gonna... Yes. Many people have pointed that out to me on Twitter. I think it is perfectly <laughs> fine for Chloe, for Chloe Zhao to take inspiration from something that I don't like. And I can still like Chloe Zhao's movie. <laughs> how dare you? How dare you? Uh, John Lee donated and said, noticed a lot of critics said that the movie didn't feel like a Marvel movie. I just hope this doesn't tell Marvel and Kevin Feige to go back to the traditional formula and stop trying different things. Sad that my Asian brother Gilgamesh died so fast. Um, I don't think they're going back. Feige's very clear about what he's going to do, and he's going to do it whether you're on board or not. And that doesn't mean he doesn't make adjustments or whatever, but I think he's very clear about where he wants to go next in this phase four and how far out he's going to go. But I do want to say something. I'm getting real irritated by seeing people online going, well, it was too much for your small mind to handle. They Jack Kirby the fuck out of this. I'm cool with you masturbating your comic book brain that you developed in the back of a comic book shop. But fuck off with that shit. We want to connect to these characters. And there was nothing in this movie that has not been done in cinema before. If not, was it done fully in the MCU? There have been shades of it. Certainly, if you can look, you can look at the independent uh, movie style of Captain Marvel and compare it to a little bit to what Chloe Zhao was approaching this as well. It, it doesn't 100% work to tell these bombastic movies in an independent style doesn't 100% work because it's not quite made to fit in that style. So it will work for some people like Michael, but it won't work for everybody like 100% like it doesn't for me. But the Jack Kirby stuff is great and it's cool, but we saw crazy shit in Doctor Strange. We saw crazy shit in What If. We went out into space in Marvel. We had scrolls. So don't give me that shit that it's because we don't we don't we can't conceive of Jack Kirby that we don't get the movie. There are legitimate concerns about the movie. So get off your high horse and listen to what people are saying. That was my I mean, two listen, I just wanted to get I've had to, I've had to listen to people tell me that I don't get what Zack Snyder is doing for years. <laughs> I've never so told you. So you that. can so you can you can just take this now. I look I do think I do fair, think that fair. I do think that part of what part of what this movie why this movie might not sit right for everyone and by no means am I saying everyone who doesn't like this movie doesn't get it. Right, but right. The Jack Kirby elements of the Marvel Universe, just as the Jack Kirby elements of the DC Universe, are some crazy things. Like, oh, yeah. giant space robots floating around saying, hey, I'm going to go lay an egg in this planet and send some robots to, like, 
b- make humanity do a thing. Like, you're dealing with some pretty out there shit. Like, much more than just going into space. And that combined with Chloe Zhao coming in and directing a movie in a very different way, it does make this feel very, very different from other Marvel movies. Like, I think that is, like, whether whether you love that or hate that, like, it yeah. doesn't feel, like, Doctor Strange definitely has some out there visuals and some crazy shit, but it still definitely feels like it follows that sort of Marvel, like, I'm a, I'm the hero, I'm the, you know, I have to go on my journey, here's this bad guy who in the origin movie is never, is usually not that interesting, mm-hmm. but I'm going to fight him, like, it, it, this is definitely a different thing. It's more ambitious, and whether they succeeded or failed depends on how you felt about it well we had ego the living planet that's pretty jack kirby man that's pretty out there in the jack kirby things i'm just throwing it out yeah but i I know i know know. i'm just saying you had the human avatar and kurt russell (laughs) that's true that's that's a fair point actually um all right uh let's see and a princess geek says hmm hi oh she says hi i'm I can't finish watching your live but i will finish it once it's up i had to ask this do you feel that marble jumped the shark Having Harry Styles in the MCU, what was the point of Kit Harrington in the movie? Um, well, we'll address a little bit later the 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 post credit scenes for sure. But did you guys? Do you guys? I don't think they jumped the shark with Harry Styles. Harry Styles has been building himself up as an actor over the last few years, so I don't think it's a bad move, and he certainly felt very natural to me. And uh, the other part of it is um, Kit Harrington. I think Kit Harrington's in the movie because they're going to go with the Black Knight. And a lot of that is connected to a number of people that are coming or are currently in the MCU. I, I, when I was, I was talking to somebody about Kit Harrington in this movie and mm-hmm. I compared him to Nebula in Guardians. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Nebula has more screen time in Guardians than he does in this, but it's where one of the plus minuses of the Marvel Universe is they know they've got the movies. Like, oh, yeah. It's not like they're like, oh, well, we better get everything in this one because we don't know if we're making another one. At this point, Marvel can make whatever the fuck movie they want to make. So yeah. Kit Harrington is in this movie to be Cersei's anchor to humanity and show how much she loves humanity because she loves this guy. Yeah. But he's in the movie for like five minutes. And then we get the post credit sequence that kind of leads into where he's going to go. And I think that just like with Nebula, where when I watched Guardians, I was like, oh, yeah, she was cool. She was like Gamora's bad sister and she kind of had some cool funny lines and she looked weird. But by the time you get to fucking Infin- Endgame and Infinity yeah. War, you're like... Nebula's arc is one of my favorite things in MCU, <laughs> and she really she really moved me and she's the best part Agreed. about this. Like you like you're moved about it. and I so I think like things like Dane with Dane in this movie or Kingo leaving and not being there for the third act battle in this movie, which you're yes. like, well, that never got resolved. I think when we see Eternals 2 and whatever the next crossover, like we will watch these movies a couple years from now and be like, Oh yeah, that really they they started it there and they did it. Or maybe maybe they'll they'll fail. But like they've proven in the past that things that didn't seem fully baked in a certain movie, they've stuck the landing later on. Is that good or bad? Is that good cinema? Is that good cinema? Bad cinema? I can't say. Right. But I know that when I got to Infinity War and Endgame, I was on board with everybody's arc. So I think it's the same here. <laughs> maybe Shannon. Yeah, I was gonna say like uh, Cersei having a human boyfriend. That could have been anybody. Like all you needed was oh, the yeah. connect, was the representative sure. of, the, of the of humanity of the human race. The fact that they were that they used Dane Whitman because this is a character who is going to be used further down the road. Yeah. I think that's that's a brilliant move. Um, in terms of the Harry Styles, like I, I saw Dunkirk once. I don't remember if he was any good or not. Like I, I'm sure I've heard some of his music at some point. Um, him showing up did not did not bother me. Um, but I'm trying to think of like when I was in when I was in middle school, if the MCU was happening and you know new kids on the block showed up at the end, would that have bothered me? I don't know. <laughs> is, is Harry Styles' presence is that bothering? Look, no one buys the fact that you don't know who Harry Styles is. No one. You're, who you're fooling? No one, Shannon. We know you've got his music on your fucking iPod. Don't lie you, to you us. You caught me. Yeah, you exactly. exactly. <laughs> we do boy band stuff, karaoke every week, every year on my birthday when we have it. So, we do in, it. We do we NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. That's, yeah, that's, that's from that's a different fair. time. Look, there, there are other, there are other <laughs> pop stars, musical music artists who show up in movies that cause me much stress. Yeah, uh, I am sure next week on Geek Buddies we'll talk about Wicked casting and we could talk a lot about my concerns about Ariana Grande. Um, Harry Styles showed up. Harry Styles showed up. He walked on screen. He 
was so fucking natural. I was like, I'm take it, go yeah. run with it. Like he, yeah. in in just the few moments that he had, uh, he didn't feel forced. He didn't nope. feel wooden. So like, as far as I'm concerned, y'all styles it up in the MCU. I'm on board. Let's see where he goes. Bring and it on, Star Fox. <laughs> and having Pip along with him, I think is going to really help. Having Pat Oswalt, which is a set, he is geek royalty. So having him essentially be his companion will, I think, uh, 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 gloss over any concerns anybody might have with Harry Styles being a part of the MCU. Uh, although I do like somebody saying that you sing watermelon sugar in the shower, which apparently is one of the... Yeah, I just Lanier. read that. Is that, a, is that a song? Oh, stop it. Oh, you know, God. You know you know that song. Oh. You know you know that song. All right. Anyway, let's keep oh, going. Oh, I'm, I'm not down with what the kids are listening to. I just listen to my Beatles and my Elvis Presley. We were just talking about singing NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. I mean, at this point, you know, when we were kids, that would have been, that probably would have been the same <laughs> amount of time. Uh, all right, let's let's run through a few of these because we've got to get back to the movie here. We've got a few of these. Thank you, everyone who's sending in donations and, and stream. It's really nice. Chris Sanchez. Thank you, Chris. He says, if after this movie, if you aren't having the best, most delicious conversations about creation, existence, our place in the universe for hours, and instead default to, was this a good or bad Marvel movie? And this movie was not for you. Love all of you. Thank you, Chris. I agree. There were some big concepts tackled in this movie. Certainly, um, oh, oh, God damn it. What's the fuck? It? Arakesh, what's his name? The big Arashem. The, big, Arashem. Arashem. the stuff with Arashem, that is that is the foundation of sci-fi, right? Questioning the creator. It is always the foundation of religion. It's the foundation of sci-fi because it's connected. All of that was there here to see in the movie. Certainly in the idea of humanity and the things we've done. You know, sometimes I forget because I've lived a long life and I've lived a few centuries. I forget that like, you know, so there are people coming up behind me who maybe don't know about these other things or what humanity has done or whatever. And you got to create space that they've got to kind of go through the journey and they show it in the movie here. What did you guys think about the big concepts that were presented here in the movie? Did you find that you were having discussions with yourself and others about these concepts? Yeah. I mean, like that, I think that is, that is why I uh, am all in on this movie because yeah. I think questions about, humanity and all their flaws and what's good about us. I, like, I saw some people saying this earlier in the chat, so I'm not uh, I'm not saying this on my own, but to mm -hmm. answer the whole Chloe Zhao was inspired by Zack Snyder, I think Chloe Zhao is doing the more optimistic, uh, less dark and rainy version of what Zack Snyder likes to explore. And I think that the reason that, and look, no, because like that is Zack Snyder with He's Batman very versus Superman, he is not. Uh, with Batman versus Superman, with Justice League, like he is grappling with some of these bigger mythic issues as well, as many of you guys who are big Snyder fans, Snyder fans love to tell me. Mm -hmm. But where where he... Um, you know what? Don't take the shots. Don't take where the shots. He, but where he lands, but where he lands, it's just not my vibe. And Chloe Zhao is dealing with a lot of those same big mythic issues about humanity and gods and the relationship between them. But it just is in the way, like her vibe is my my vibe and so it really really works for me yeah all right um uh, i like this one uh from derek he says hey mike well fuck my facts is my new favorite <laughs> phrase <laughs> i love this show loved eternals and selma selma is still my favorite crush since desperado blade is coming and a second eternals definitely will be at world forge eternals never die yeah. probably very very true uh, and yes, we should make that a t-shirt. Well, fuck my facts. We should absolutely make that a t-shirt. Um, all right. Uh, Tariq says, I like the film, but my two main issues were the structure along with trying to fit so much into the runtime as well as the humor as a lot of it felt like it was out of a different film, especially from Kingo. What's y'all's thoughts? Um, I feel like we tackled that, don't you think? Was there any more you wanted to add to what uh, Tariq is asking here? I think, I think, we, I think it is going to be, uh, the Marvel humor works for me. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's my vibe. It's why I'm really into the MCU. But I do think that it will be interesting to see because I do think that in like that dinner scene, for example, where yeah. they're like, well, who's going to be the next Avenger? Like when I saw that in the trailer, I thought that maybe was going to be a part of a bigger conversation that went somewhere. And it's not really. It's just the, and it does feel a lot like a note from Marvel being like, hey, put some funny bits in here. And so I do think it'll be interesting to see if they do get away from that when they do say Blade or some of these other movies, like are they going to let their Marvel movies, some be more serious, some be heavier? It'll be interesting to see. We're, yeah, Shannon? 
Well, I mean, there wasn't really a shared tone amongst them because, you know, we had talked about sort of the colloquial nature that they spoke and like that, that went back to when like Fastos was first talking about the combustion engine and then he ended yeah. up introducing the plow instead. So it was interesting because I don't feel like it totally worked, but when you're, when you're dealing with character journeys that span thousands of years, I mean, is, do you want to tack on? the way that their speech and vocabulary have developed as well. Like, it seems mm. like sort of like, I, I don't know how much it gets you, even though there were parts that I was like, eh, yeah, I didn't care for that. Well, mm. I think when you have like here, like this is like literally the type of conversation that you would have at, in a room with Marvel, with all the executives where mm -hmm. logically it probably makes sense to have them all come down and talk in some alien way and be very alien and foreign. And then when we see them later in the movie, they've adopted colloquialisms. Uh, but if you yeah. like, but if you do that, you are going to have even less of your audience yeah. connect with them. Yeah. Like the the argument is have them come down and maybe it doesn't make perfect logical sense, but we need everyone to fall in love with these characters. We yeah. have limited screen time. We need to get people to know who they are right away. So I think it was the right choice, even if it arguably is not the most logical choice. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's a great point, Mike. Uh, and as a showrunner, you know, you got to get the audience hooked in immediately. And then from there, you can uh, take them on the journey. Uh, Carol has two back to back. So I'm going to read these all as one. I really enjoyed the movie overall and ended up seeing it twice. I thought it looked stunning and kudos to whoever came up with Macari's speedster special effects. Certainly Shannon is a fan of it. They were amazing. DC's Flash should take note. Uh, loved Thena, Druig, and Fastos. However, my big issue is that they spent a lot more time with Cersei and Icarus than anyone else. I would have loved more time between Thena and Gilgamesh and Druig and Macari. I would have bought their relationship more had we spent more time with them. I agree a million percent. Um... But that wasn't the story they were trying to tell here. What do you guys think? Do you think that we've spoken about the relationships. We would have liked to have seen more, but would it have made sense to organically show more with Thena and Gilgamesh and Druig and Makari? Well, I mean, the fact that that this this much of the audience connected with that with mm. those those dynamics with such Great a limited points. amount of time yeah. means that like it would have been nice to have seen it, but you didn't need it because mm. you were on board with them right away. Um, the one that apparently needed more attention was the Icarus Cersei uh, uh, pairing. But again, we had just talked about like maybe that was done by design. Like maybe they're not supposed to have the greatest chemistry, and that's why they're right. not together. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, the the movie is all about Icarus versus Cersei. Like that's what the movie comes down to. Those are the two extreme opinions on the Eternals. So you're gonna spend the most time with that relationship. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. that's that's the again like it's it, it i'm i'm kind of on team shannon on this one which is like look the fact that everybody loved all these other characters so much means you did get enough to fall in love with the characters and it would have been great to spend more time with them but as we've all said uh shannon's already slicing the movie up as we speak so <laughs> well i i think shannon makes an excellent point when you say certainly um don lee and uh, angelina jolie did enough with their screen time to make you care about this relationship so that when Gilgamesh dies, you feel it. And you feel Thena's pain as she uh, reacts to the death of Gilgamesh and their connection when, you know, the little moments, the touches and the smiles and when he talks her down after she's swinging her weapon and whatever, like there's real connection in those moments. Uh, and so you have enough of it. I think you 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 don't need more with Drew and Macari because they're not central to the movie necessarily. And you get enough that you can tease. You'll be teased that there'll be more to come with them as the um, situation goes on. And don't discount the fact that these are not that well known actors, Barry Keegan and Lauren Ridloff. So they want to introduce them to you, give you a little bit of time with them, and then later, as you get to care about them as actors and as characters, we're going to get a lot more with them down the road and uh, more show pieces, showcases for them in the films. Just well, and also, yeah, and also, I mean, like the way that things are set up for the next movie, yeah. um, who did Arisham take at the end? He takes, he takes Cersei, Kingo, Kingo and Fastos. Is it Fastos? It is yeah, Fastos. I guess it would be. He's, yeah. yeah, he's the last one on earth. So yeah. is Sprite still on earth or? Sprite's not? human now. 
Sprite's right. human, so she's right. on here. Right. Yeah. So like, so going what's going to be interesting is one of the ways that you get to spend more time with characters is when you split the characters up. Like in this yeah. in Eternals, everyone was kind of together the whole time. So every scene you are writing, like, okay, I got ten people I got to deal with. In yeah. the next movie, you're going to have Thena, Druig, Makari, Pip, and Star Fox here. Mm-hmm. You've got Fastos, Circe, and Kingo here. And you have Sprite uh, as a human on Earth right. with Dane. So mm-hmm. however these things are all going to come back together, when you're jumping back and forth, you're going to get to spend more time with characters. It's why Infinity War works so well, because they split up the team. So you had this team here on this planet. you know, like, And so that's going to be really interesting. And I think that we are going to get to see Druig and Makari's relationship mm-hmm. uh, deepen and get more interesting as we get to the next movie. Yeah, Thena, Druig, and McCarthy are on Domo. And like Michael said, Cersei yeah. Fastos, King and Sprite remain on Earth. So yeah, that will be interesting. That's an decent thing. And then we got Star Fox thrown in. So a yeah. Star Fox Thena scene is just going to be really, really insane to watch for sure. Um, all right, uh, True North Seventeen says, "Great discussion, buddies. Thank you." Uh, Jonathan Hale says, "I think there's a barrier to entry when your characters are godlike. It makes them unrelatable somewhat, even though these characters should." in theory, be the most relatable and human. That, plus juggling 10 or more characters, is where the movie lost me. Yeah, I've seen that complaint when it comes to Superman sometimes. Like this idea that, or Captain Marvel even, this idea that it's so powerful and so godlike that it's difficult to connect. But I don't know. I've never had that issue with these kinds of characters. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Is uh, uh, was Jonathan Hale right here? Well, it depends on the story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you have a character like Superman, like Captain Marvel, like the Eternals, who are uh, like Omega level powerful, mm-hmm. um, having them fight somebody ultimately doesn't get that interesting. It's like it's a bunch of it's a bunch of CG punching. I think where Eternals sort of flips the script a little bit is it's not oh are we strong enough to fight the Deviants? Yeah, uh, and it's not even really are we strong enough to like put the Celestial to sleep? Even though they do, it's like this is a fucked up family. And they clearly set up Icarus as the absolute strongest of all of them. Yeah. So when they all have to go up against him, it's like godlike characters going up against godlike characters. It evens the playing field. And so I thought that the battle at the end with Makari and Icarus, with Fastos and Icarus, like it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, Shannon? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when you do have, and and that's sort of a knock that DC has gotten because because the you know the Justice League characters mm. are so, are sort of so godlike. Um, I think at the end of the day, the power base doesn't matter. Like it's all about right. the, the personality of the character. And to what Vogel was saying earlier about um, sort of the colloquial nature that that some of the characters spoke, like that's that is how you connect. Mm-hmm. Um, because one, it doesn't make it that interesting to have this this developed speech. Uh, but also it's like you, you just you you connect to him right away. I mean, any time like, you know, people can argue about Henry Cavill all day. But I mean, if you really want to find a good Superman, like watch Justice League, the animated series. I mean, yeah. that's that's a Superman that even though he is essentially a godlike character, I mean, he's he's very, very relatable. Yeah. Well, Christopher Reeve, certainly. And sure. uh, on the other side, I mean, th- I think that's also why they made Momoa a surfer dude, because it's like, OK, let's let's make Aquaman relatable. Let's have Momoa do it this way. And so that's how you do it. Or even Wonder Woman, the way they did it with um, with her. It's her experiencing the world for the first time. So we've all had that universal experience in different ways. So we were able to connect with Gal Gadot's journey in the movie, uh, for sure. That's how you break down the godlike thing. Um, Tariq says, not Eternals related, but I never get to catch you all live. So I figured I'd ask now, have any of you thought about getting a Letterboxd account? I think it'd be awesome to follow you guys on there, see your lists, rankings, film watching history, etc. I I don't know what this is. Oh, it, well, it, yes. I, I know Styles I know as much about this as Harry star. Styles. <laughs> <laughs> well, Letterbox is an app you get where you uh, deliver a quick review of a movie, whatever you watch, and give it star ratings and your thoughts. So maybe the, Tariq is asking us to do that officially as the Geek Buddies, a Geek Buddies Letterbox account, which all three of us would put movies on and our ratings on. So we'll possible. fight about it. We'll fight yeah. about it. We'll or fight great. about no, it. Another thing possible. for us to fight about. <laughs> the Goonies is definitely going to be in there. <laughs> <laughs> TK says, hey guys, great show. Keep it up. Do you think the MCU's version of Galactus is actually a celestial and this is their way of bringing him in? Uh, I don't know. Stump the buddies. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> well, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think that like we've been Galactus is right up there with the mutants in that every time we get any new bit of Marvel information, we're like, no, it's that. That's it. That's mutants. That's that's, that's Galactus. <laughs> 
And I think that I don't know that they're going to use the Celestials to kind of give us our their version of Galactus. I do think that given the past that we've had of Galactus being a big fluffy cloud and Galactus being other things, I think when they go Galactus, they're going to go, this is Galactus. But I do think mm. that opening the the universe up to there are these giant space robots that created everything um, have given us the cosmic leeway to have a giant dude in a big purple helmet that's going to come down and eat Earth. So I think that I don't know that they're going to use Celestials to create Galactus, but I do think yeah. the Celestials give them permission to have something like traditional comic book Galactus show up. That's yeah. fair. Yeah, 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 that shot of Arisham at the end where you yeah. see the giant, like, six eyes and everything. And then even in What If, and granted, it's animated, but the uh, Ultra Vision moment where he's literally eating mm. a planet, like, they, they have now introduced this concept. You know, back when back when they had just done, I think, Iron Man 1 or Iron Man 2, and, you know, the the uh, the, the path had kind of been laid for them to get to the Avengers, um, there was a lot of questioning, e even amongst the fan base, like, okay, yeah. you, you have this grounded version of Iron Man, like this, this, this super tech. How do you work in uh, a super soldier from the past? How do you work in a god from Norse mythology? And they found a way to do it. So at yeah. this point, even though Eternals may not have landed for everyone, um, they've now introduced these concepts that are going to be more palatable for an audience that may not be comic book readers. Yeah, you, you, you throw up the trial balloon to see the reaction, or you let you just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit to see if it if, if it passed muster and no one's got an issue with it, then you go forward. And subcon it works subconsciously. It's not that you've seen these images. If you're watching everything, you'll be much more attuned, as Michael said, to accept it easier when it comes down. Um, Shamir Kelly says, I saw the movie today and leading up to watching my expectations had been mild because of the reviews and the trailers weren't that exciting. While watching the first half is slow, but the second half is amazing, full of, full of action and the twist of Icarus I liked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We had the opposite experience. It's the old opposite for Johnny. <laughs> but I respect I respect that you enjoyed it. But honestly, I got no problem with people who enjoyed the movie. That's just, I, understand the, I don't understand the fights uh, on social media. I'm like, you, you let people enjoy or dislike the movie as long as there's legitimate reasons what do you fucking care like, i just don't understand um eric underscore nunez says great discussion and different viewpoints thank you it is is it me or do you guys think sprite ajax druig won't have much of a chance in a one-on-one -on -one fight with the deviants they should not be staying alone agree with mike on the love triangle yeah that was a good point you made michael so uh but what do you guys think uh sprite ajax druig one of my, well, certainly uh, Sprite, well, she's human, but won't have much of a chance in a one-on-one -on -one fight with the Deviants. Well, I mean, I think what was one, one of the things that was really cool, I was talking to one of our friends who was like, well, I don't understand if the Eternals were built by the Celestials, why didn't they all just have Icarus's power? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, uh, because I don't think they were building an army. I think they were building people that were going to help spurn evolution along, and you needed different people to do that. But I think what's really clear at the beginning of the movie, which was really neat, is that... You make your face all you want, Shannon. It's like these, <laughs> these people these people aren't here to kick ass. They're here to like shepherd humanity along for thousands of years. <laughs> um and fight deviants. But I think what was really interesting is um the the team is clearly split into your uh your offense mm -hmm. and your other characters that have other roles. Like, and in the beginning, <laughs> you're of the not movie, offense. <laughs> well, you're not offense. Like you have, but like the, it's really clear that like, um, you know, Icarus, Kingo, Fina, Gilgamesh, Makari come out swinging at the beginning and Sprite, Fastos, Ajak, and uh, Circe don't come out until the deviants are taken care of. Like it's a, it's yeah. very, it's very, very clear. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting that like it's, it's clearly by design. Mm -hmm. um, and, but just like with Circe in the movie and the whole point of the movie is I think that, and this I do think is maybe a subtle thing that Chloe Zhao is seeing is saying, and I think it'll be interesting to see if this carries through is that, mm -hmm. The superhero genre is built on the strongest person is the best person. Right. You know, Thor is the most powerful. Hulk is the most powerful. And here, Icarus is the most powerful, and he's not the one who is who Ajax chooses at the end. Like, maybe Sprite, Ajax, well, Ajax has gone, but, like, you know, Sprite, Circe, some of these other characters, like, who you don't think of as the strongest, who you don't think would go do well against the Deviants, maybe there's another role. I mean, I think yeah. the thing they're setting up with the Deviants is... Look, the deviants are being manipulated by the celestials as much as the eternals were. Mm -hmm. Like they are set up to go do a 
serve a role. And then when they serve that role, they're punished for it. And I wished with the Deviant storyline, they had like delved into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I think that the role of the Deviants in the movies moving forward is not gonna be, we are the big monsters that you have to fight, but more like, fuck, we're like your, we're we're siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Well, it, well Sprite can escape. She she can she can provide enough of a diversion that she can leave. Like she is that going to help her in a in a fight? No, mm. unless she comes up from behind you and and gives you gives you the shiv like she did to Cersei at the end. Um, Ajax can heal herself. Druig, you know, I mean, he he it clearly wouldn't work. But I mean, the fact that he can kind of uh, take over a human's mind, yeah. could he do that with a deviant? I mean, he didn't do it during the fight, so yeah. It, yeah, the marketing for the movie was kind of weird because the whole idea of fighters and thinkers, that was something that was kind of done with like the social media marketing, but they didn't really they didn't really identify it in the movie. Now, and now for, for folks that are on are online a lot. Yeah, not a big deal. Like you, you basically knew going in. Right. Um, but for folks that may have just been completely blind going to watch the movie, um, I could see where that would be that would be a little confusing. And just because like someone in the uh, chat had mentioned the marketing, there was one thing I wanted to bring up and I didn't want to forget. Okay. Um, so the idea that Icarus was the bad guy, that was an mm -hmm. idea that had been chatted about, chatted about amongst our oh, yeah. friends. Like I, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, the moment that the movie started and the first time we see Ajax in the present, she's already dead. It's like, oh, you fucked it up. Like you've given it away in, yeah. in the marketing because the only person who talks to her during the modern day is Icarus. That's a good point. It was like that, what, that was a horrible, horrible mistake. If you and make the connection. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That, that drove me nuts. I felt that way about seven. I knew Kevin Spacey's voice with one in this, so I know who the fuck John Doe is. But it, you just can't. You, sometimes you just never know. And I think what I've discovered, though, being in a part of way less people watch trailers than you think. Yes, they they're there, but a lot of people avoid them actually and go in cold, which I think is a fascinating way to live life. I had no <laughs> idea that's a thing, but a lot of people apparently do. So it's kind of crazy. Um, uh, wanted to throw in. Okay, so let's. Uh, I, I love. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say to everybody who's watching. Thank you. We have over four hundred and forty people watching us live. Thank you very much. Please remember to hit that like button. We only have two hundred and five likes, so we'd appreciate it if you. That get means. Us the Thanos snap level of you have not clicked <laughs> like yet. Half of you, you want to snap your fingers and click like. The half of you right now. didn't like the movie, please click like, for God's sakes. Like this, for God's sakes. Get us over there. Get us at least to 300 likes in the next few minutes. We'd appreciate it. So please hit that thumbs up button. Tony uh, brought half of you back. The least you can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right let's see i want to make sure okay okay eric nunez okay okay and casey briggs super convenient that day one of being prime eternal is having arisham completely lay out the true evil plan in the history of the celestials <laughs> well convenient and day one of being the prime eternal also is like 48 hours before an eternal is going to pop out of the earth so <laughs> gotta tell her at some point <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> what, what is my what is my job as the prime eternal? I'll tell you later. Oh shit! <laughs> you never mentioned this. Uh, <laughs> them demo says uh, so. We know that Gore, the God Butcher, is coming in Thor four. Yeah, that's who um, Christian Bale is Christian playing. Bale. I believe. Do you guys think that we see more celestial action in that movie? Possibly Gore going after the Celestials, or possibly Gore was the one who decapitated the head of nowhere. K-N-O-W for these reasons. I think that now that Celestials are a part of the MCU and the bigger, wider universe, yeah. that you will see other movies pick them up when appropriate, uh, whether that be Guardians, whether that be Thor, anything that is more of the cosmic space level stuff. Captain Marvel. Uh, I think we could see, yeah, Captain Marvel. I think we might see them mentioned or brought up more now that they have been introduced. Yeah, okay. I thought it was going to be Guardians 3. I, I don't I don't think they'll touch upon that in the next Thor movie. Yeah. I think they'll let, I think you I think you might uh, Mike you might be right there. I think they're going to be real um choosy about where they put in the celestials. Um cuz you're not going to put them in, in Moon Knight, are you? So they're, they're just throwing it out there. Um Max Cohen says from my earlier chat Galactus was just for me. It's more that nothing was done overall when so many things could have been done with them. 
That's fair. But no, give no, it look, time. Think, They're just laying the groundwork. Man. But I do think it is true that the deviants in this movie... Like, I think one of the big issues that I have with the movie is that they've introduced this idea that there's this deviant early on that can absorb the powers of the Eternals and that this is new information. This is a deviant who's yeah. never done this before. But then all we really find out at the end is these were a bunch of deviants that were frozen in the ice. Yeah. Like, like they kind of set up this idea, and I think it's like the bait and switch. Like, they want you to think that the deviants are the big bads and that the deviants are the ones that are going to do it. And then you're like, oh, no psych it's really icarus yeah. but i think introducing this idea that a deviant can do something that a deviant never did before and then have this deviant get intelligent to the point where he's basically going to be like look you people are the killers you're the bad guys he's not entirely wrong mm -hmm. and then Thena just slices him up which don't get me wrong Thena slicing it up was slicing it up was awesome but i do think that like ultimately there were some really interesting ideas that they could have used with the deviants that they aren't and yeah. maybe just like with Druig and Makari's relationship, just like with Kingo disappearing and not showing up for the third act, these are things that we will see in Eternals 2 or Avengers 5 or whatever else yeah. um, where it's going to come into play. Um, but I do think that as far as this movie by itself, that is definitely one of the weaker points. Yeah, I want to touch upon that, but we got a few more, but I want to touch upon that because I think that's a great point you bring up, Michael. I want to discuss that because like the whole thing of the Celestials is they're surprised by what they're supposed to be doing here, which is to bring about a celestial that will destroy, uh, or an eternal rather, that will destroy um, the entire Earth and humanity, right? The deviants, we discover that the deviants were actually created by people like uh, Aramesh to... Arakesh, what is his fucking name? Arishim. 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 God damn it. Arishim to it just doesn't make sense in my mouth erishim to um come down and be the apex predators and do all this kind of stuff so he created and they achieved a certain level of intelligence and then tried to survive as a creature that is that exists would do to try to survive so in essence they were also hard done by er erishim and the rest of the crew so you would have thought that they would find a kinship, especially as he was achieving intelligence, that that deviant would understand why these celestials were being sicked on them by Arashem. So they would have come together as common creatures that were created by Arashem um, and rebel against him. So I found that odd. So, yes, it was cool that Thena cut him open, but I also thought they kind of pissed away an opportunity to have that kind of overall conversation about. And it does seem to be that's where they're going. I mean, like everyone's yeah. saying, and we said like the next movie is going to be at the World Forge. There's going to be other Eternals. I assume mm -hmm. there's going to be other Deviants. So I think that this bigger idea of exactly what you're saying is yeah. probably where they're going. Okay. Um, and they said that enough in this movie because, yeah, it's really clear. Like, look, the Celestials put the Deviants on a planet to get rid of all the other Apex, the, uh, to get rid of the Apex Predators so that whatever race it is that needs to gain intelligence can have time to do it. Yeah. And then they started killing whoever the main race was. So that's why the Eternals came in. And then, uh, so that's like, that's all built in there. But yeah, the Deviants and the Eternals are both being used by the Celestials. And as the Eternals are stepping outside of their role and saying, we're not gonna do this anymore, it stands to reason that the Deviants need to play a role in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Geeky Gal says, uh, really vibed with it and most of the characters. I do think a little more with Icarus and Ajax would have gone a long way to have her death hit harder. Yeah, do you guys think so too? I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think anytime you get to spend more time with a character, uh, their 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 fate is going to hit you more. Yeah, especially, I mean, if you watch, I got to be a part of the press conference listening to Sama Hayek talk about how much she loved playing this role. I would have liked to have seen more. And I don't mm -hmm. think there's a way to bring her back, I guess, in other than flashbacks. But I would have liked to have seen more with her. Who knows? Derek Johnson says, do you all think Chloe took parts of the Neil Gaiman run on Eternals? Sit behind me somewhere. This story, it feels like she took some key parts and switched characters. Do you guys think that happened here? Yeah, I mean, like I think where what Marvel does pretty well is they manage to stick to the spirit of what they're adapting, but they take mm. liberties, uh, and that's true of Civil War. It's true of the Infinity Saga. Like it's true of everything. And yeah. so I think here as well, I think they took some of the best things of the Neil Gaiman run of the Kirby, uh, you know, creation of the Eternals, but they definitely like put it through the MCU blender and came out at the other end and said, now this is what Eternals is for us. Yeah, uh, Shannon. Well, I haven't I haven't read that Neil Gaiman run, so I can't say. Okay, okay, fair enough. I'll let you borrow. Hey, just, don't, just just don't lose the cover. Brandon Davis says they had to write <laughs> around the sprite actress who was going to grow up. I guess that's fair. 
I guess that's a oh, fair yeah. point to throw out there. Yeah. Oh, no, they absolutely did that because they definitely want to keep Sprite in the movies, and they definitely have plans for the Eternals that go beyond a few years, and she's going to age. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, all right, let me see. I want to make sure I get all these uh, streamlabs that have come. Okay, here's one. Some person over here. Uh, SJC360 says, so how far, so far, how do you feel about Phase 4 compared to the previous phases? Ooh, that's a damn good question. <laughs> um, I mean, we're throwing in Black Widow, we're throwing in Falcon and Winter Soldier, Loki, we're throwing in um, uh, WandaVision, and we're throwing in Eternals. Anything I'm missing? Oh, and what if? So, mm -hmm. feelings? Well, to Shannon's point from the uh, beginning of this whole chat, mm -hmm. um, which was echoed by a couple of our friends when we saw the movie, um, this fear that Marvel might be buckling under their own weight, that there's mm -hmm. too much going on. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I think they've got plans within plans. But what I appreciate about Phase 4 is that I think we all got so used to, especially by like the end of Phase 2, Phase 3, like we didn't know how they were going to get there, but we knew we were doing Infinity Stones. Right. I mean, they made it pretty clear. Thanos is looking for them. There's Infinity Stones. There's an Infinity Gauntlet. So we had that roadmap and we knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. I think right now with Phase 4... What concerns some people, but what I really appreciate is that I don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Like we've got we've got uh, Val over here, Julia Louise Dreyfus, creating her like Thunderbolts or her Dark Avengers or whatever she's doing. We've got the Ten Rings from Shang Chi that you're like, well, there there's a signal, and we don't yeah. know what the What's signal the is. Yeah. And now we've got the fucking Eternals over here uh, having this cosmic battle with the Celestials. And by the way, there's a multiversal war coming. So like there <laughs> right. is so much going on. And so it definitely, there is that, how the fuck does this all come together? This is definitely why, but I love that Marvel's not doing a wash, rinse, repeat. Like I love yeah. that phase four is not just, okay. And now we're putting together the pieces for this next big villain to show up. Like they might fail, but at least you got to give them credit that they are swinging for the fucking fences. Oh shit. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Chef. Phase phase three is 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 act three of of all of your favorite movies. It was just mm -hmm. payoff after payoff after payoff after payoff. Um and when you with phase four, we're kind of starting we're starting over, but we're also continuing. So yeah. the fact that there's so much on the board and the board is getting bigger. Um yeah, it's it's fascinating to see, but also phase four is the first time we've got stuff on we've got the series that we've got the yeah. Disney Plus series. Yeah. And I think that the main difference uh between this and the previous phases is uh we are going to be inundated yeah. with uh with with Marvel with Marvel stories, which I think is awesome. Yeah. I didn't mean to leave out Shang Chi. You're right. Thanks for bringing that up, Mike. Yeah, that's another part of this as well. Yeah, I think what's so interesting is like, yeah, they're they're literally you know ripping the edges it's, it's like play-doh you're just slashing it and they're trying to stretch the play-doh out as much as possible to cover as much as possible because we're gonna get we're gonna get street level shit and we're gonna get medium level shit and now and with eternals we're gonna get way out there shit so it's gonna be how they are able to keep you focused and how they pace this out i think is going to be essential as well that's what really worked with phases one two and three is they were able to pace it out keep it back down boom, 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 keep you back do 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 comedy boom uh way more bigger uh, uh concepts to deal with to balance out the comedy so all of it was there to work and i wonder how they're gonna how if they're gonna be able to make it work but i love the chances they're taking whether you like it or Here, not overall i love the chances they're taking here's the thing that i like the most about it yeah thought of this today as i was just like pondering life um with with celestials and the Cree. Yes. And the scroll and all of these different alien races and cosmic level powers. Mm -hmm. If they get far enough, they're finally going to be able to do the fucking Phoenix story correctly because they've built a universe where they can actually do the Phoenix story correctly yeah. and not have to like make up some shit in one movie to be like, oh yeah, she's just really powerful, I guess. Like, this is going to be the actual cosmic Phoenix force that we are going to get. If That's they get there. Point. That's a great point. What if this whole thing is leading to the Phoenix Force? That would be incredible. Yeah, yeah, Man Milk, of course. But it hasn't come out yet. Of course, let's not forget Hawkeye, Spider-Man, No Way Home. Of course, of course, of course. But it hasn't come out yet. So, um, now Francisco Lopez says, hey, guys, I really enjoy this movie. So Thanos was right, right? He probably knew about the Celestials, planted a baby in each planet. Also, I hope in the sequel they will explain why or how Ego is different from the rest of the Celestials. I okay. hope so too. 
<laughs> I hope what, so too. But was Thanos right? No. Okay. All right, Shannon. Cersei was right. Thanos, the we're we're going to prevent this alien from popping out of a planet by deleting half the universe is probably <laughs> not. I'm gonna call that a overreach. That's an overreach, is what that is. <laughs> Kingo's Kingo's argument in the movie, mm-hmm. where he said like, we're we're keeping things, we're keeping billions of lives from being born. It's like, yeah. but those haven't happened yet. Right. We're talking about the existing life. So no, Thanos was not right. Oh, which degree to disagree. Uh, Jacob <laughs> Riley says, do you guys have a business email? I would love to send you a life talk. I wrote on loss and depression during Thor's MCU journey as illustration. Icarus flying into the sun was a beautiful moment. I- introing Erisham basically just brought the idea of God to the MCU. Hashtag crazy. Yes, this I want to <laughs> talk about. And I was very curious to talk about it with my friend Shannon McClung. And of course, Michael as well. But Shannon is the most religious of us of us three, I would imagine. I would argue. Although I do believe in God. I'm sure, Michael, of course, you believe in God. Um, but Shannon is the one that gets all kind of weird about certain sexual jokes. So he's very, you know, he's very old school in his approach to religion. Did the idea of Arashem, I mean, this essentially possibly replaced God, unless we're going to say God created the celestials and all this kind of stuff. Do you, do, do, did it bother you in any way, shape, or form as a person who is religious. No, no, because okay. these are stories. These are stories. Okay. This is, well, this is, well, this, so, this, so is this. the Bible. <laughs> oh, okay. But, oh, okay. Right. Pump you the know bricks. what? Pump You're the not getting us canceled tonight, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, this I is, like, but <laughs> this is a fantasy. The question was to me, T- pump, pump the bricks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, Anti-Semitism, <laughs> anti-Semitism. Oh, no. Pump the no. brakes, you godless heathen. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> Oh my lord! <laughs> no, this is no, this is fantasy. And just because, okay. um, just because Arishem and the Celestials exist, does not negate the existence of God. Mm-hmm. So even though Steve Rogers may not have been right that there's only one God, um, I, I think I think God exists in the in the MCU. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Look, I think when I think of the Celestials, uh, I think also I think the same way that Neil Gaiman sort of deals with it in uh, Sandman with the Endless. I think that. Mm-hmm. The the fact that there are godlike creatures and creatures and creatures and beings with powers that are basically godlike to us in the universe doesn't preclude the fact that there is still a greater power somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That, I don't that, think it's an old guy sitting on his throne on a cloud looking down on all of us, but a greater power nonetheless. Okay. In the Bible and in the Torah as well, there's no guy sitting on a on a cloud throne. Yeah. Yeah. I can say that with some authority. That was, that was, that was just some artists, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just with a bunch of tablets. Um, uh, we, we don't have, Jacob, we don't have a business email, but uh, I can send you an email and then we'll, I'll share it with Shannon and Mike. Uh, absolutely, if you want to send something, Jacob. So, all right, those are all the Streamlabs Super Chats now. So let's get back to talking a little bit more of the movie. If you want to keep sending them in, please make sure you send them in now. And also, please make sure you hit a like on this video. Let's deal with uh, well, let's deal with the plot points here. Did any of the plot points, and then we'll jump into the um, deleted, uh, sorry, the uh, post-credit scenes. Did any of the plot points bother you as we went through this? Did, is there anything we haven't talked about plot points-wise that you all want to address or bring up? Or, or or talk about here no i thought everything was there everything okay. was there for a great movie to me it all just comes down to a lack of pacing okay okay mike i did not have the pacing problems uh that shannon had but I, like i said i think i think we've covered it i think that for okay. me i think that cersei's power abilities when it comes to organics and the way they were sort of trying to build that into the arc and then be like, well, I don't know what I can do was a little bit clunky. Mm -hmm. I think that Sprite being in love with Icarus had to be told to us because it wasn't really shown at any point. Yeah. And I think that the deviant that can absorb abilities uh, kind of coming out of nowhere. uh, And again, they might be able to explain that later and then it's fine. Uh, You can do the Dave Filoni thing. Like, explain it to me in another medium and now I can watch this and go, Oh, it makes sense. So, (laughs) um, so like that, those were the three kind of big things that I, especially upon second watch was like, yeah, they didn't really nail this, but I think everything else was there. And you know, as far as the pacing of it goes, I really do think like 
it really does come down to like how connected you are to the characters. I was so into these characters that they were sitting around having chats and I was like, I'll chat with these people all day. I love them. Mm -hmm. I'm in. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are my three big things, which I think we've hit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think we've talked about everything that I would have had an issue with, I believe overall. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, and yeah, yeah, we covered it. The God thing was a thing that I was really thinking about a lot. And made sure I wanted to make sure we referenced it. Um, all right, let's jump into these deleted scenes. Uh, I've got it written down, so I want to make sure. Post-credit scenes. I'm sorry, post-credit post scenes. Jesus Christ, post-credit. And uh, Arisha. Arish, Aramesh. No, Arish. Oh, nope. whatever. Had it, you had it right the first time. Yeah, this, right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's jump into this. As uh, uh, Let's see. In a mid-credit scene, we see Thena, Makari, and Druig on the Domo. They are visited by the Eternal Eros, or Star Fox, Thanos' brother and his assistant Pip, which is voiced by Patton Oswalt, who offer their help. And in the second post credit scene, we get a Dane Whitman opening up an old chest inherited from his ancestors that contains the legendary Ebony Blade, while an off-screen voice, which a lot of people are claiming is um, Harsh Ali, questions him if he well, is ready for it. So A lot of people are claiming. Chloe Zhao is claiming, and so I'm willing to believe her. Okay. She's like, she's like, it's Blade. It's Blade. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, what do you? What did you guys feel about these two uh, post credit scenes? And whichever one, whichever one of you wants to go first, talk, please. Well, kind of to like the whole connecting to the MCU. I mm -hmm. think that I assumed that one of the post credit sequence was going to tie back to you know. Uh, mm -hmm. the, Doctor Strange, like what, like there, there's a giant celestial in the ocean now. Mm -hmm. What is everybody's opinion on this? Is Bruce Banner freaking out? Is what? So I thought it was going to be that, and the fact that they were like, "Nope, we are going to keep going in this other direction." I was like, "All right, like we are getting into Pip, we are getting into Eros, we're getting into Thanos's brother." Thanos's brother, Shannon was texting me. It mostly, it was great. I thought Harry Styles was great. Yeah. Pat Oswald is finally in the MCU. God love him. He, he, this is where he belongs. But uh, I think it basically, the Harry Styles of it all, the arrows of it all, just creates more questions for what this means. Because in the comics, um, the Eternals are not space robots. And so there is an Eternal, right. and he has two sons, and one is Eros, and one is Thanos. And Thanos looks like the way he does because he has a deviant gene in him. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. Um, but was everybody on Titan an Eternal? Or if they weren't, I just assumed that everybody on Titan kind of looked like Thanos in the MCU, but like mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to be the case. So what makes Eros an Eternal? And is Thanos going to be part deviant? Or are they going to explain that? And is mm -hmm. Thanos a space robot? I'm assuming he's not. So it just, it really like the Star Fox, bringing in Star Fox and saying, I'm an Eternal, uh, like you guys, and mm -hmm. I have this little ball and your friends are in trouble, but I know where to find them. Um, great to lead us into whatever Eternals 2 is going to be, but creates a bunch of questions about how this makes sense, which I'm sure they have figured out, um, but I'm just really intrigued on what it all means. Yeah. All right. Shannon? Yeah. I mean, the thing that I texted Vogel was the way that the MCU has presented Eternals via Arishim is that yeah. he created them. They're basically these space robots that don't age. And I was like, okay, so if Arishim created the Eternals, does that make Eros a space robot? Does yeah. that make Thanos a space robot? Because that's not really the way it is in the comics. Um, so it, it's presenting a lot of questions, and I'm sure they have answers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I love I love a good post-credit sequence. Even like Star Fox as, as a character, like I know he's kind of a ladies' man, but outside of that, like I don't know a ton about him and Pip. Mm -hmm. I know Pip's the drunken, the drunk one. Um, but I just love... I, I love a post credit sequence. I love the fact that even though this movie did not check off all the boxes for me, that it's giving us a, a, a bit of a forecast of where we're going. Yeah, there's a lot of places with Star Fox because with Star Fox, Vision's involved, the Avengers are involved, Spider-Man's involved. There was even a storyline where he was defended over sexual assault allegations by She-Hulk in, in a try Like, she was yeah. his lawyer. So there's... A lot of bases that he touches uh, that connect to the current members of the MCU that are still alive and the ones that are coming down the road here. So there's a lot of places to go with Star Fox for sure. That could be a lot of fun. And Pip is someone who was turned into that troll due to some mm -hmm. kind of enchantment or something. So what's that? How's that going to play out into all of this for sure? Uh, Mike, you were going to say something? Uh, 
No, just uh, okay. I, to Shannon's point about the post credit sequence and loving a good post credit sequence. I think yeah. that was the thing I loved about this one is like nothing we possibly could have expected, like completely blindsided. Uh, right. And it's like that being completely blindsided is a great feeling. Yeah. Um, that's true. I agree. Brian Brawler says, uh, when you hinted about what the post-credit scenes were, I was super convinced that at least one of them would pertain to Galactus or maybe server server. Well, I was super wrong. That's right. Yeah. Brian, during one of my hangouts, he's one of my patrons, Brian, I mentioned the, the, the post-credit scenes and they were going to blow people's minds, but they were not what you thought they were going to be. Um, dealing with, I look, um, the black Knight was a character that I loved when I was collecting comics in the event so seeing him be a part i mean i don't know michael sat next to me whenever dane showed i was just like excited when the when they brought out the ebony blade i lost my motherfucking mind it didn't occur to me that that was blade off screen um but the ebony blade has such a history with merlin and the curse and there there were uh, there were two dark there were two uh, uh black knights and and how's that all connect up and there were different blade that ebony blade spawned another blade so there's a lot here to explore even with just the blade how are they going to play this out? And so it's fascinating with Dane Whitman. There are a lot of places you can go. What did you think about it? Uh, Mike, you were going to say, what did you think? Yeah, about well, I what I loved is like with, with Dane Whitman, they did a really nice, like if you really watch the moments that he's in the movie, like, the, yeah. you know, she gives him the ring with his family's crest on it at the beginning. Right. And then when she's talking to him on the phone, when they're with Druig in the jungle, she's like, you should call your uncle. You've always wanted to make amends, basically, because, like, the world could possibly end. Yes. And clearly he does, mm -hmm. because then when she There's sees the him at the end, he's yes. like, hey, so as far as secrets, my family has kind of a crazy family history. And you're about to tell her. So, like... I think when we do catch up with him, like there's going to be a little bit of a, hey, here's what happened while the Eternals were fighting on a beach with a volcano. Right. Here's what he was doing that uh, blew his mind because he was like, here's this whole family history that John was alluding to, yeah. which is where he gets this ebony blade. And I also think it's really clear, like what, and maybe I'm wrong in reading this, but like based on his expression at the end, once his girlfriend was taken by a giant space robot, yeah, uh, and then him showing up in the room, like he's willing to risk it with this dangerous family heirloom that mm -hmm. could lead him down a dark path because he's like, I need this power to go find my girlfriend in space um, yeah. is what I'm assuming. So like, it, I thought it was great. Go ahead, Shannon. No, no, I was, I was going to ask a question because in the yeah. books, Dane's uncle, who was the black, the previous yeah. black man, he was, he was a bad guy, right? Because yeah. the sword made him, made him go crazy. Right. Is that correct? Blood. Well, no, it's, it's, it's his squires, ex squire, Sean Dolan, who becomes Blood Wraith, essentially the carnage to the Venom, the way they've set that whole universe up. That's what essentially happens, because then you find out later the Blade itself is cursed to work best with people who are evil or who don't okay. who don't see human or don't see other species as as valuable as they are. So that that's gotcha. kind of where it plays out. But you know, there are so many people that are connected. That Valkyrie is a part of this process. Black Panther has dealt with this blade. So there's a lot here that could throw out the scroll invasion is involved with the with the Black Knight and this blade. So there's a lot here that they can explore, Mike, for sure. Malekith yeah. is here. Uh, Union Jack, if they ever put Union Jack at the MC, which I would love to see. You know, there's a lot. And the scroll invasion as well. So there's a lot. It... What I love about it is, I mean, this one was a little bit more expected because we've all been talking about Kit Harrington yeah. as Dane. We all know that he's a Black Knight. Like, so the fact that they have a Black Knight post credit sequence was a bit more expected than like Star Fox and Pip showing up. Yes, true. But, uh, but still really, really awesome that they went that far into it and didn't save it for the next movie. And yeah. I think what I really love about this, it, and again, to Shannon's point about is Marvel going to buckle under their own weight? I just love that there's so much going on in phase four already that I have no idea how this all fits together. <laughs> like I don't. And then when they confirmed that, you know, the voice was Mahershala Ali and that it was yeah. Blade and you're like, okay, so fucking Blade showed up and said, hey, do you want to pick up that sword? I don't know if you do. And I'm like, well, what the fuck is that? Like there's just like we it, it's yeah. like I'm almost giddy with how ridiculous it is, you know, yeah. like to Shannon's point that we were like. There was a day not that long ago where we were <laughs> like, guys, they're going to put Captain America, the Hulk, Thor, and Iron Man in a movie together. Right. I don't know if you can do that. <laughs> I think it might not work. 
<laughs> and look how far <laughs> there are celestials in the sky and black yeah. knights and multiverses and who the fuck knows what else. <laughs> <laughs> and star foxes. Yeah, you just don't know. Also, Dracula is involved with this ebony blade, which may have a connection to Blade. Blade Blade. So will Dracula reappear not be Dominic Purcell and be someone else and be a part of the Blade story. <laughs> I'm down with that. I'm down with that. Anything that washes Blade Trinity out of my brain or my mouth, I would love to have on so many levels. So, um, <laughs> all right. Let me see if there's any more Streamlabs or Super Chat. Oh, yeah. There's uh, three that just rolled through here. Uh, Princess Geek said, I love you guys. I couldn't leave. I had to keep watching. I consider, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. She said, I considered myself a knowledgeable Marvel fan, but I went into Eternals blind and I don't think the movie got to me fully in a layman terms movie. You guys know who Kit and Harry are, but I didn't. Oh, uh, that's fair, but they're going to explain it. And there's a reason they put that out there. Just give you a taste. And for those of us who are mad nerds, we got excited for people with layman, the layman approach like you, Princess Geek, you, you we're going to hear more about it for sure. And you're going to have more knowledge about it and watching shows like this, give you more knowledge about it. Uh, Mike, you're going to say, no, I think, look, I think what Marvel does a good job with is, because I had a friend who was like, do I need to read a bunch of stuff before I see Eternals? And I'm like, no, just go in and experience it. Like, yeah. you're going to, you. What I think the fun is in when you're like, oh, well, what was it like in the comics? Who were these characters? Let me right. go back and do some research. But if you are just someone who just, just is going to watch the MCU and just get this stuff, yeah, you don't know, you don't know what it means at the end that Kit Harrington has this black sword mm -hmm. and what's going to happen, but they'll explain it in the next movie. And so oh, it's yeah. more of a mystery. Um, it's a mystery that you can just Google on the internet and find a bunch of information on, but it's still a mystery that you could, like, they will explain. Yeah. And, and remember in, you know, in the first three phases, the post credit scenes were teases for stuff that were coming that we didn't even know that much about. You know, did you know about the infinity gauntlet princess geek? Did you know about the stones, the infinity stones and their the collector? Did you know the collector? So what they yeah. do a great job of is just giving you a little bit of tease there was and, and It'll play out at some point. Again, yeah. and I think it was the end of Avengers, but there was a, you know, whatever it was when Thanos like popped up on screen and said, well, I'm going to have to do this myself or whatever his right. credit sequence thing right. was. And every fucking non-comic book person in the world was like, who's that guy? Who's yeah. that? I'm like, well, that's Thanos. He's going to be important. And now, of course, we all know Thanos. and can talk about him all day long. But <laughs> right. there was a time where he was the mystery in the same way that uh, the Black Knight is right now. Yeah, exactly. And ha having just finished doing the rewatch of all the movies with the Lady Ella, who's never read one of these comic books, she refers to him as the purple rock guy. So there you go. You just, whatever your connective tissue is with these uh, cre uh, characters. That's what I doing. call grimace. <laughs> That's not a rock. Is that a rock? Do you know what it is? It's a gumdrop. It's a, it's a gumdrop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got three from House of 20, so I'll read them back to back. Hey, guys, did Marvel contradict itself in, Ga in Guardians of the Galaxy, Doctor Strange, and I war? We're told the, before the dawn of time, the universe, sun, planets, exploded into existence and the stones were sent across it but now the opening crawl says before the six singularities and the dawn of creation came the celestials erishim created the first sun and brought light into the universe life began and thrived all was in balance so the celestials work is what caused the explosion of the universe and then the stones also were created and sent across the universe right uh, i think uh, hashtag confused. Also, the shot of Erishim in the sky with the people of Earth seeing this mind-blowing creature thousands of miles tall was fantastic, and I need that as a poster, LOL. So, <laughs> gentlemen, uh, answering Edward's questions, do you think they kind of re retconned the, the beginning of the universe? I don't think they retconned the universe because I think when, I believe it's Wong who's explaining the where the where where the stones came from. Yes. I don't know that Wong knows about Celestials. So yeah, I think what Wong fair. is explaining as much as they understand that when the universe happened, mm -hmm. these stones formed, what we get at the beginning of Eternals is, yes, also what humanity doesn't know because they don't know is that before yeah. that, there were Celestials. So I think that yes. it's not so much retconning as explaining in more detail with more knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's the, this isn't a perfect, perfect, comparison but it's the unreliable narrator like uh the narrator up until this point has only had so much information right so now we're finding out that there's someone else that knows more the unreliable what unreliable Na narrator 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 right? narrator narrator what is happening? narrator what is narrator happening? narrator n-a-r-r-a-t-o-r -R -R -R. what is narrator happening? 
It's we've narrated. Now discovered, we've now discovered <laughs> that Shannon says a word really, really weird that we never knew before. Narrator. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, narrator. I got a problem with Arisim? All right, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Between the two of you, it's like, you know, Alaska, the narrator. <laughs> Harisham. Narrator. Uh, Brian, Brian Brawl says, I just read the Black Knight solo series that came out not too long ago today. Do we think that the ring Cersei gave Dane will help against the curse of the Ebony Blade? Perchance. Yes. Sure possible that's a good I think, it's, point. I think it's really possible i think that the ring will be important mm -hmm. uh so yeah i think that'll be really interesting to see i'm excited like i kid harrington as a black knight going through space to save his space girlfriend who is off trying to like bring like get all the return the eternals I, it's a lot going on i'm into it, it is it is um all right let's see uh shannon any thoughts on that or do you agree with michael yeah i mean i I, I think yes, but at the same time, I think part of the um, part of not charm, but part of the allure of that character is seeing yeah. Dane get to a point where he, it looks like he might go bad. I think that's I think that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting for a story. You can tell he's nervous about picking up that blade, and with Blood Wraith, the possibility if you go one direction, and Black Knight, the other possibility if you go the other direction, it's going to be interesting to see a struggle, and that's why you cast someone like Kit Harrington who has played the struggle of going one direction or the other, you know, so it, it'll work. Um, uh, Philly G donated just a little bit. Thank you, Philly G. Thank you. And Jacob Riley says, according to Hamberland, Hamberland, okay. According to Hamburger Land Cannon, is that, is that right? <laughs> uh, which I didn't know was a thing. Grimace is a taste bud. So there you go. I apologize. Grimace <laughs> is a taste bud? That's according to you know, he's, Hamberland he's a taste Cannon. bud. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> he is a taste bud? I had no Guys, idea. when people made up these characters, they were doing way too much cocaine. That is insane. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> Grim Grimace has a podcast with the Hamburglar called The Taste Buddies. <laughs> Terrible. It's a dad joke. All right, Casey Briggs says, uh, real quick, with what citizens... Uh, let me bring it up. I want to read it correctly so you guys get a little credit here. With case with what with what citizens of Earth have been through an MCU, when they say Erisham, when they see Erisham in the sky, they probably thought, <laughs> shit, it must be Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> it's true. People been through people been through some shit. Although what I, I what I will say is when you think about it, what's mm -hmm. interesting is most of what we see in the Marvel universe is kind of isolated. Like, you know, like people in London, there was a big spaceship in the sky. Like New York got attacked by aliens. Everybody knows about that. Like there's certain things that everybody knows. And then yeah. there's a lot of times that the heroes do stuff that we, that the, the rest of the world doesn't really know. Like people don't know what Ant-Man is doing in the quantum realm. And True. people don't know what's going up in space. But like, even the fact that like aliens attacked New York and a few years later, half of earth disappeared Yeah, for five years. And then everybody just came back. Yeah. Uh, that's enough. And then you're like, now nah, there's a giant alien in the sky. I gotta move. Oh, it's all of Earth. I can't move anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it all started with Iron Man. That rich, two rich guys in, in metal suits are having a a grudge match on a oh, bridge. Yeah. Then it's it's the small town in New Mexico that has right. visitors from another planet. I mean, yeah, the, the Earth six one six has has gone through some shit. It's been building, that's for sure. Uh, Derek Johnson <laughs> says, uh, I'm literally clipping this last segment out and saving it for all time. Laugh my ass off. Ha, ha, ha. There's another T-shirt. Narrator? Narrator. Narrator? Okay. Narrator. 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 There you go. Narrator. 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 Uh, that's, oh not that's not how it goes. said. That's not how it said at all. Uh, this is why the Collector is a celestial being who's been around for millions of years, like Ego and Grandmaster. And in game uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, he showed that video of each Infinity Stone um, uh, ES on, I don't know what that means, the searcher. So, um, could we have an, an interesting all celestials comedy approach to this with Grandmaster and the collector and all this? I think, is there possibilities here? Yeah, well, it will be. I mean, I, I do, I do wonder, like, be, and like you were saying about ego is Kurt Russell, it's like, yeah, there's. There's the Celestial's giant space robot Celestial, and then there's, yeah. like, these smaller Celestial beings. And I wonder if that's going to get covered or explained or if we're just going to be like, eh, don't worry about it. It'll be interesting well, to also see the if collector, they the collector might be dead. 
I mean, according to Infinity right. War. <laughs> with possibly dead. You're right with what uh, Thanos did to him. Certainly possible. He's alive and well at Disney California Adventure, where you can see him every day when you ride Guardians Breakout. <laughs> uh, Esau and the Searcher is another celestial. Oh, okay. All right, John. Thanks for schooling me there. Jesus guys, Christ. How the how galaxy many, is very crowded. How many of these motherfuckers are there? All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. I think that's all the Streamlabs and Super Chats. And I'm going to bring something up, guys, because this just broke about an hour ago. So I want to bring it up uh, to see your responses to this. This is a surprise for both Mike and Shannon. And let me see if I can take a look at this. And thank you to everybody who's been joining us tonight. There's 460 of you all. If you haven't hit a like button, take a chance to do that now. We're about to cross 300 likes. Take a chance on us. Take a chance on what are we, What's the surprise? What are you surprising us with? This is the surprise. The new Spider-Man poster for No Way Home <laughs> has been released uh, an hour ago. Reactions, thoughts. Clearly, Doc Ock is, Doc Ock is there. Who is that in the background? Is that Green Goblin that's, in the that's background? That's Green Goblin. All right. That's that looks... that's Willem Dafoe, Green Goblin. Right I don't know. There. It's like Silver Surfer to me, but all right, fine. It's the Green Goblin. Um, what we got do lightning. You guys... We got sand. Yeah, you got yeah. So Doc Ock, Electro, Sandman, Doc Ock, Electro, Sandman, Green Goblin, all yeah. there. What's it? What's he? What's he on a pillar? What's it? Was this a broken building? A destroyed building? Is that what this is on fire? Yeah, that just yeah, that just looks okay. like wreckage. All right. What do no, you guys? No... What do you guys think? Yeah, he's in. The... I... He's in the iron suit. I mean, it's a great think, poster. Yeah, and and at least this is the first sort of studio confirmation that there there could be Sandman. Um, great point. There's not there's not six bad guys up there. There's only four, so we don't yeah. see we don't see a lizard tail and yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was who was the? Rumored... I don't see Rhino. I don't see Rhino either. <laughs> I mean, I is it lizard? Is it Rhino? Rhino? <laughs> is it Venom? Like, who knows? Yeah, I don't see Venom. <laughs> Right, I don't see uh, whatever his face is. Uh, the other guy is Carnage. I don't, unless that's Carnage, that's Carnage been created from that he's standing on. I don't know. If it is Carnage. I will flip <laughs> everything. I'm yeah, gonna yeah. lose it. I'll flip the table. Lose it. <laughs> uh, uh, Brand Brawl says, "Do we know the cast of Blade already?" I think, but no. past Mahersha Ali, we don't. Yeah, no. So, we, don't, we know very, very little about Blade. Yeah, uh, that poster's awesome. Director I think that poster's right. Writer. Yeah. And like I think somebody said uh in the chat, I think that uh the, the rumor is that the the trailer for No Way Home will be next week attached with Ghostbusters Afterlife. Ooh. Rumor, that's the rumor. That's we also have a big rumor. week this week. Is it Dis Disney Day is this week, isn't it? Disney Day is Friday, November twelfth. So I'm thinking of going live all day. I don't know if you guys want to come along and pop in if you can, but I'm just thinking about it. So could be a we'll fun see. If you guys have time all day to sit around and, and do Disney Day, I think that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> See the discoveries, a little geek buddies uh, uh, watch along. Um, all right, I think that's everything for the spoiler review. Anything we missed, gentlemen, that we, that we haven't talked about? Just want to make sure before we wrap up. I think we uh, we think we covered it all. Okay. Well, all right. where would you guys put Eternals in your rankings of the MCU? Good question. Solid. In the solid lower to mid teens, in terms of the Whoa. number. Yeah, yeah, that's where I would put it. I've seen it three times, and I don't need to see it again for a very long time. That's what I would say. <laughs> Are you both looking at your list? No, I, yeah. I've got mine. I've got. <laughs> where's where's your shit? Where, where oh yeah, you where's your shit? Um, so I do not have the Disney Plus series on this. I just have the films. Yeah, but I don't right put the now, series in there. Yeah. Uh, Eternals is number 19 for me. Oof. Just below Age of Ultron and just above The Dark World. Um, I do have the Disney Plus shows on my list, okay. but I will put it uh, around early early teens. Early okay. teens. 12, okay. 13 ish. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, all right. Well, let's wrap it up there. Thank you all so much. Uh, Andreas IB says it's top five for me. All right, Andreas. Nice. Nice respect to you. And I saw a lot, I saw a lot of people. Brian Brawler said it's my number one movie. So I've yeah. seen some other people say they really love it. It's in their top five or top three I've even seen for some people. 
on uh, Twitter. So pretty incredible to see that for sure. Um, if you haven't already hit a like button, please do so as we're wrapping up here. But I uh, just want to thank you all so, so much for taking the time to hang out with with us three and talk about, and, and enjoy our conversation about this. To have over 400 people joining us on a Sunday night when you all should be asleep is uh, very nice and very uh, uh, humbling for the three of us. So thank you very much. Thanks for your stream live and super chats. And thanks for being so bubbly and so lively in the chat. It's a lot of fun to have a chat that is jumping and hopping the way you guys are uh, for sure. Um, uh, Shannon, what do we have to tell? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media, on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies, on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media, on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung, on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca Says. Mikey? Uh, if you loved Eternals, if you hated Eternals, we are glad that you stuck with us through all of this. And we love all opinions. They are all welcome. Yes. Uh, and if you want us to keep giving our opinions, here's what you can do to help us out. Uh, definitely hit the like button if you have not done it. Um, subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. I know your comments in the chat were amazing. Leave some comments in the actual YouTube uh, show so that we can see what you guys uh, thought and get back to you on that. If you are listening to us on um spotify or apple podcasts or anywhere where podcasts are available leave us some stars and some comments because it helps us go up in the rankings and the best thing that you guys can do is retweet this video post it on your socials and tell everybody to check out the geek buddies absolutely there you go and um and you can follow as you said you can follow me the rogue says but also on twitch you can go and follow me the outlaw nation on twitch i'm gonna start doing more stuff more games more play alongs, more watch alongs as well and if you want to be part of the patreon and geek out with the outlaw nation overall go to patreon.com slash john roca and see all the multiple tiers you can be a part of i think we're getting to the point where the geek buddies may explore the possibility of starting our own patreon if we start if we start like writing out some things that people can get at certain levels if they donate at certain levels every month. So we'll see. I got so much. I don't know if I can handle like that, it. But like, like that t t-shirt. <laughs> Nerditor. Nerditor. I don't even know how you spell Nerditor. that. Nerditor. Oh, sorry. Nerditor. Nerditor. Right. It's literally spelled. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't spell. It doesn't sound the way you're pronouncing it, the way it's spelled. I don't know. Nerditor. This word, I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> All right, we're out of here. You guys are awesome. Thanks to Sean Barreto for working overtime in the chat. We appreciate it madly, brother. Thanks for helping to co-produce the show. And we will talk to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't forget, our, our show comes up, our, our show coming up uh, uh, in a couple of days here. Our regular show comes up on Wednesday for sure. And get ready because we got Hawkeye. We got some Star Wars stuff coming, Book of Boba Fett. All that is happening. So stay tuned with the Geek Buddies with more stuff coming down the road. Certainly, Spider-Man Noah Hill. I'm sure we'll have a non-spoiler and a spoiler review for that as well so kids stay tuned and be a part of everything we're doing here on the geek buddies y'all take care have yourselves a great sunday night and a great week and we'll talk to you next time another brand new spoiler review episode or regular episode from the geek buddies hey!